last time out in Portland, it was an American dream for Nick Cassidy and Envision Racing. Nick Cassidy takes his third win of the season on 0% energy as he crosses the line. Yes! Yes! <laughs> and the Kiwi now stands shoulder to shoulder with Jake Dennis, Pascal Verline, and Mitch Evans in the race for the 2023 driver's title. For rounds 13 and 14, we are back in Europe because the Formula E World Championship arrives in Rome. For an absolute lesson in the classic, this historic and stunning city is about to host one of the most crucial doubleheaders of the season so far. And we're better than the eternal city for our electric gladiators to do battle. Four in contention for the crown. But who will fall? Who will rise? And who will be ruler? at the Hancock Rome e Prix. Prepare to be entertained. Pick the side, pick the side. Only two options, be with the winners or the other guys, yeah. Ain't no time, ain't no time. We already on the way. Better get themselves in line. Thought I told you we don't do no rules up in the house tonight. The champions up there. Good afternoon, hello and welcome to round 13 of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. It is race time and we are live from Rome. What a city this is. So much culture, so much history, so much beauty. Everywhere you look is like a movie set. And the way the FE Championship has unfolded so far is like a movie script. Four races left. Top four are all championship protagonists, all with contention to go all the way and lift the title. Few points separating them. After qualification, it's now even closer. It's safe to say that really has put the cat amongst the proverbial pigeons. To talk about that and much besides, we have two fantastic gentlemen here. The apt Cooper Reserve driver, Kelvin van der Linde, AKA the best export in South Africa since Savion Blanc, and Oli Askew, the former Andretti driver. Oli, first of all, this championship has delivered so much excitement. It's still unpredictable, we can't quite call it. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, Radzi. We have our top four championship competitors, all starting within the top 10 here today. Kicking off our last four rounds, heading into London in a couple of weeks, and 32 points separate those four drivers. So I think it's all to play for at this point. And Kelvin, this track is the perfect place to do it. Proper street racing, and it's already delivered drama. Lots of drama this week, and we've already seen our first casualty in qualifying with Jake Hughes, unfortunately unable to start today. But you can see how quickly it happens. And I think now on the race, a lot of our contenders are a bit further back on the grid. You're going to see them taking a bit more risk. Can it cause an accident? They'll, ha they'll hopefully try and stay away from that and hopefully get into the points today. In terms of the top four, it is all about the focus on who will be crowned world champion. This really is a battle of gladiatorial proportions. Feast your eyes on these here. Leading the championship is Jake Dennis from the UK, leading Nick Cassidy by just one point. 29 points separates first and fourth. Mitch Evans getting three points after fantastic quality performance earlier. But when it comes to wins, things are slightly different. Jake Dennis with just one win this season. By comparison, Nick Cassidy and Pascal Verlein both on three. How's Jake where he is? By virtue of podiums, a record breaking or record equaling eight podiums. The same number as Pascal Verlein and Mitch Evans combined. But it's worth noting that when it comes to Jake Dennis, he either gets a podium or no points. So, so much jeopardy here today. Ollie, with yourself, Mitch Evans in fourth place. Could he still lift the title, do you think? Yes, of course. There's four races to go, and he's he's at his, uh, we can say this is his home race. He's, he's so good here in Rome. He swept the weekend here last year, on pole here today. Lots of points up for grabs this weekend. I think he's really looking forward to, to gaining uh, some solid ground in the championship here this weekend. And also on the spot, Kelvin, one name, zero explanation. Who will be the 2023 Formula E world champion for you? I'm going for the underdog, Mitch Evans. He deserves it after the last couple of years coming so close. So let's see what he can do. Well, he's right there behind us here. And I have to say, we love Formula E for so many reasons. We love the camaraderie, but we also love the competition. And behind the scenes, Saunas has been finding out what's really been going on, AKA Saunas, we call him, the Oracle of Formula E. Absolutely, yeah. I, I am here with Pascal Verlain. So just a quick chat with him uh, about where you're starting this race from, because I imagine you would like to be further up the grid, but there is still opportunity during the race. Am I wrong? Yeah, definitely. I think um, a lot is possible, especially here. Um, you know, the last couple of years, there was always safety car, or yellow flag. So, um, yeah, P10 is not ideal. I think could have been better, but um, it's not a bad position as well. 
Okay, well, we're looking forward to seeing what you can do in the race. I'll see you at the end. Thank you. Now, it's good just to talk to Pascal Verlein there because he is one half of a very big rivalry that we've seen developing over the season and sort of come to a bit of a head uh, in this, this week. Now, if you have been staying tuned to the uh, Formula E social media channels, you might have seen a little comment from Jake Dennis in regards to him and Pascal's relationship, but perhaps not being uh, the best or not being a very... a bit of tension, let's say. But it's to be expected because we have the Avalanche Andretti team, the customer and the manufacturer team of Porsche, uh, where there needs to be collaboration between the two. And there is a collaboration, and Jake has since said then that there is a good working relationship between the two teams. So naturally, there is going to be a little bit of spice, a bit of rivalry uh, between a customer and a manufacturer, especially when the customer has got all of the bragging rights. So that's uh, the situation there. It's a rivalry that we're very much looking forward to seeing how that develops on track. But it's not just the case with that manufacturer and customer relationship, because the same is actually true between uh, the Jaguar-powered cars of the Jaguar TCS Racing Team and Envision Racing, also where the customer team of Envision Racing is beating the manufacturer team of Jaguar. It's David versus Goliath, and David, on both counts, is currently winning. And just to finally wrap this all up in a little package to kind of follow on from what Razzie was saying there, there is this assumption that Formula E is a lovely championship, everyone gets on really well with each other and uh, you know we'll go for dinners after the race, all that is true uh, and it is one of the best things about this championship, but do not for a second, I want to make this very clear, think that there isn't anything but fierce competition and rivalry under the surface in Formula E. These guys will stop at absolutely nothing to get one up on their teammates. So all that talk of rivalries, all that talk of customer versus manufacturers, now we get to see it on track and I could not be more excited. Saunders, well said, we could not be more excited and talking about getting one up on your rivals. The man to my right, Mitch Evans, has done exactly that in a literal sense in that he's currently pole sitter and Sam Bird, his teammate, is P2. Mitch, we needed the stars for it to align for you to perform well in Rome. The other top three have possibly fallen by the wayside and here we are. Could lightning strike twice for you like it did last year? <laughs> uh, it normally doesn't, but I hope, hope, uh, hope we can change that. Um, look, it's been a good start, but we need, we need a really clean race, good race. Um, Look, qualifying is just one little part. I think we've seen this year. Track position is not absolutely critical. Um, I guess the main thing for me was picking up the three points and just, you know, put a little, a little uh, dent into that that gap that I've got at the moment. So, um, yeah, look, it's gonna be a really strategic race. Um, we're gonna be smart, play it right. Hopefully, the car's obviously quick over a course of a race distance. So yeah, it's uh, and I'm expecting those guys to come through as well. So I'm, uh, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a tough one, but I'm I'm up for the fight and hopefully we can. Um, you know, repeat what we did here last year. We know you're a clutch performer. All the best today. Cool. Fantastic. Once again in Rome, cool. race well today. We're going to head this way though, and talk to the lads here because Mitch, he's a cool customer. He never gives an awful lot away. It's always great to talk to him. But can we talk about what Saunders touched on there, the rivalries in Formula E? When you guys race, is there somebody who you think, I've got my eye on you. I want to beat you more than anyone else. There's always that one guy that you have in the, in the field that you really want to beat more than ever. I think in the, in the crucial parts of the championship now, these four, they know where each one is on the grid. They've analyzed that with the engineers. They know exactly where everyone is, especially for the guys, Jake Dennis and Nick Cassidy. They're in the middle of the pack with Pascal. They'll be racing each other harder than anyone else on the grid. I think that's what's going to be interesting today. They've got to survive. They've got to keep their heads cool because they don't want to get into a controversy between themselves. They want to get forwards. They want to make a point and chase this man behind us. Let's see what happens. So, Oli, is it personal or is it business when it comes to racing? It's business. Let's not forget there is a world championship, an FIA Formula E world championship yes. on the line here. Everyone wants that, no matter if it's you're battling your teammate, someone else with the same powertrain, doesn't matter. You want it for yourself. And that is what's making Formula E so, so exciting. You can see here, this entire grid here is absolutely packed to the rafters. So many people want to get a glimpse of the drivers, get a moment, get a word with them. We're going to be speaking to the drivers as the course of the next few minutes encroaches and carries on. So much here to talk about, whether it is the rivalries, whether it is the World Championship, or whether it is the roasting temperatures here in Rome. But it has to be said, the Rome Epri Round 11 here in Formula E is getting right underway. Head of the Hankook Rome Epri, we caught up with special guest chef and former FE team boss Alan McNish as he shares his recipe for a perfect world champion every time. 
at this point of the season, the championship is really heating up. And at temperatures like this, you need to have a team of people that are functioning perfectly. And in any good driver and team, you need to have all the key ingredients. And all these ingredients work together to build a championship challenge. And we've got four drivers at the front of this championship that's doing exactly that. They've got character, they've got speed, and they're all that little bit different. If you go back to the last race in Portland, what a fantastic victory it was by Nick Cassidy. Absolutely delivered it from the middle of the pack, got himself into a dominant position, got his elbows out, and he delivered. Perfect victory at the perfect time, just to set himself up to go into the last part of the season. And then we've got Jake Dennis. Super, super consistent, especially in the last five when he's finished on the podium. But he's had a bit of a spicy relationship lately with Pascal Verlein, who had such a strong start to this season. And then suddenly it dropped off and he couldn't catch a break. Everything seemed to go wrong. But then he pulled himself back into the title fight with a victory. And now he is really in the mix. And then you go a little bit along and you've got Mitch Evans, three time winner round Rome. He will definitely be in the fight come Saturday and Sunday afternoon. However, I think it's gonna come down to their teammates. Who's going to be able to deliver that point of taking points away from the opposition? And in that situation, I think Da Costa is the best wingman you could ever have. He's fast, he's aggressive, he can deliver every area. But also, I wouldn't underestimate Sam Bird. Maybe, like Icarus, he flew a bit too close to the sun on a couple of occasions this year. However, without doubt, he knows how to win. He knows how to deliver a fantastic performance. And that is exactly what his teammate needs out of him this weekend. Service, spicy aroma pizza for Formula E. It is literally and metaphorically hotting up here in Rome, but the fans are out in force. They can't wait to see the race action. A little stat for you, by the way, during qualifying, the track temperature got as high as 53 degrees. Speaking to one of the production crew, their shoes genuinely began to melt. But qualifying had so much drama, so many stories to talk about, and just touching on pole sitter and P2. Ollie Askew, Mitch Evans and Sam Bird. Front row lockout for Jaguar is an interesting scenario, but there were race orders that were possibly given to Sam Bird, we think, from James Barkley. Yeah, there was a tactical game there from, from Jaguar in that final duel between the two teammates. Um, they told Sam Bird to just to let Mitch get those three extra bona bonus points for pole, which could prove crucial at the end of this championship. We know that he's, uh, he has the momentum behind him now, and we can expect him to have a solid race today. In terms of the championship, second and third, Pascal Verlein, Nick Cassidy, they were out of the duels. We're now seeing them in P7, P9. How much of an effect will that have on them? Well, they're both under massive pressure today. I think they have to take a lot more risk. They have to burn a lot more energy to get up front. And that'll be the challenge today, really, to make the moves early on when everyone's tied together. The first lap is probably going to be their biggest chance. So I expect the both of them to take a bit of risk on the first lap. They need to survive, of course. They can't afford a DNF here but they need to burn that extra energy. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out towards the end of the race. Interesting also to find out what Nick Cassidy makes of this track, of the fact that it's so narrow and do not have many overtaking opportunities. Let's find out as he spoke to Saunders. So, Nick Cassidy, I was glad I didn't get a chance to catch up with you after quali because, you know, where we're going into this race is dramatic. How do you feel about the position you're starting from? Yeah, it's been one of the most disappointing things of the day, to be honest. I really thought you'd come speak to me, but... <laughs> No, we're oh, you're talking about them from qualifying then. Oh, 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 I am. It's post quality, you know, like Saunders. Maybe I'm just, maybe it wasn't good enough for him. I don't know. Where is he? <laughs> OK, right. Let's, let's get it down to business. Let's talk okay. about this race because we have seen you win from positions here and further back. Is it going to be as, as possible today within this track? Anything's possible. Um, it's going to be harder, that's for sure. But uh, we'll just give it a crack. 
Well, if you talk briefly about advantage and small gains you can get on teams, I think you've got a massive gain by being on the side of the track that has this shade before the race, because these guys over there are cooking. Yeah, yeah, maybe. We take every advantage we can get, right? So, so for you right now, what is the objective? Is it race win? Is it maximum points? Well, you scored the most points by winning the race, so why not? But um, no, it's going to be tough, I think, especially two Jaguars up the front. They're going to lock that out, um, I assume. We'll just do the best job we can and see where we end up. Well, we're very much looking forward to seeing what you can do, mate. Thank you. Thanks. Currently seeing a shot there of P2, which is Jaguar TCS Racing's Sam Bird. We're going to see if we can get a chat with him, if the camera likes to follow us around here. Now, Sam's currently speaking to his team, and I'm very curious to know where his head is at, especially given the fact, just for context, if he did not see qualifying. So Sam qualified for Jules. He went in Group A. Then his time was deleted by virtue of a yellow flag. It was then later reinstated minutes before he then took on the race itself. Sam, good to talk to you. Where is your head at right now, given the context of what happened in qualifying and given that you're now on front row? Yeah, I mean, uh, the aim is obviously to score as many points as we can as a team. We're standing first and second, and um, we've got the perfect opportunity to do that. It's going to be a hard old race because the Nissans, Envisions, you've got the Porsches, even the McLaren, they look strong. Um, but look, we've, we've got the best starting positions. Uh, we need to be smart, we need to be clever, work together and see what we can do. And what does success look like for you today, given that you actually have had victory here a few seasons ago in Rome? Starting second as well. <laughs> oh, interesting. So, yeah. an omen. No, I mean, look, Mitch is higher up in the, in the championship. He's going for the world championship. I think we know what that means. Um, if, there's a, if there's a role that I can play, awesome. Well, we'll look forward to seeing that role unfold. All the best, Sam. We'll see how that race is. And it's very interesting to hear Sam talk about a team. Because when it comes to a team, if you think of a team like Porsche with Pascal Verlein and Antonio Felix da Costa, they've very much shared team points. But when it comes to Envision Racing, that's been very much Nick Cassidy that's usurped Wemi. But in the team championships, they are still one and two. Another name I haven't mentioned there is Jake Dennis, who's currently leading the championship standings. Let's head over to him now. Who's with Saunders? So, Jake Dennis, let's talk about where we're starting from, or where you're starting from. Let's talk about what that means for the race and, crucially, the championship. Oh, it's going to be a big race. Uh, you know, it's going to be one of the hottest, uh, hottest races of the year. So if we can try and just survive, try and pick up some, some valuable points uh, against our competition, then I think we've, uh, we've done a good job. Obviously, Mitch is going off the front row. Uh, Jaguar seem extremely strong. Uh, which I expected to come into this weekend, so it's no surprise. Uh, but yeah, honestly, if we can finish top four, because I think it could be a Jack uh, powertrain lockout on the podium, uh, then I feel it would be like a win for us. Okay, interesting. So you're always pretty open with talking about strategy with me when it comes to these sort of races. What do you think is going to be the difference between winning and losing here with the heat, with the track position? I think attack mode will be the crucial part of the race. It is going to be very difficult to overtake, to be honest, especially if the guy genuinely wants to keep you behind. If he lifts on his beat point, then we should be able to pass, but it's very rare that ever happens. So uh, it's always different strategies going on, but I think attack mode will be a crucial part of the race, especially the second one, if people take two minutes, four minutes or six minutes. Because, uh, yeah, if you're up against someone on a 300 power mode and you've got six minutes worth of 350, you should pass them. Uh, don't hold me to that, though. <laughs> I'll probably be stuck behind someone for six minutes and 300 after this race. But uh, ultimately, now nah, looking forward to it. It's going to be hot. Uh, it's what we all train for. I'm looking forward to it and just get our robots out, try and beat some blue cars and maybe uh, Sasha. So, uh, yeah, let's get involved. Say it so eloquently. Just to finally talk about the heat, I just mentioned to Nick about, uh, you know, he's your championship rival. He's one point behind you. But you both have a big advantage in this heat of being on the shaded side of the track before the race. Doesn't sound like much, but that's got to mean something. Yeah, we'll take any positive we can get right now. Thankfully, the cars are in the sun because it's actually a benefit, that is, but uh, for the tyres, for the start. So both sides of the grid are equal, at least. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a big difference between left and right at the moment on the, on the grid over there, which is uh, not great because, uh, obviously, I'm on the clean side today. Uh, but, yeah, looking forward to just getting a, a really good race in, a Formula E race, and uh, try and do some overtakes along the way. And turn four, five, six, and seven is going to be a, a really difficult park. It's such high speed, and, uh, and that big jump is always interesting. We love Rome, and after all the chat this week, we could not be more excited. Be Have great. a good one, mate. Thank you. An honest assessment there from Jake Dennis, the championship leader. Just one point separating him and Nick Cassidy, all for the man from Nuneaton to do. And an awful lot still to come here on the track as the racing is about to go underway here at the Hancock Rome Ypres.
a stone's throw from the track in the Italian capital, Saunas and Kelvin took some time out earlier in the week to settle a score over two of the championship contenders. Take a seat, my friend. We've got some business to discuss. What, are we going to play a round of chess? Or? No, what do you think? not chess. Yeah. We're going to play Formula E stat and find out which driver trumps who. Let's go. I've got some specially made cars. I'm going right. to give you the, the choice of the first one. Now, what we need to do now is fiercely battle whatever driver is on that card, uh, as they might. Oh, Nick Cassidy, man. Which means I, of course, have Jake Dennis. They're both great drivers, but these stats are Formula E and full career stats. Yeah. So, Jake Dennis, number of Formula E races, 43. I got the same, 43 for Nick Cassidy. Yeah, they both started the same season, so that makes sense. Same age. Which, that's very true. It's Formula E career wins, I think I've got this one, four. You don't have it. I've got four as well, but you're only as good as your last race. And if I look at the wins this season, I've got three. Uh, what yeah. do you got, mate? Jake's only got one. Yeah. Lots of I knew podiums. I had that one. <laughs> podiums this season. How many has he got? He's he's got six podiums <gasps> this year. You got it again? No way. Jake has eight podiums this season. That's impressive for both of them to get that many podiums in a season, regardless of what team, what driver. That is both impressive stats. Formula E career pole positions, four. I've also got four. It's so hard to separate these guys. But I will say, I think he doesn't need a pole position to win the championship this year. Highest championship finish, Jake Dennis, third. In his rookie season, I'll add. Cassidy's highest championship finish is 11th yes. on mine. But I will say, this is the first season he's had a car that can give him the championship. Gen 3 stats are kind of very different, aren't it's they? It's a new car, it's a new style of championship, and I think Nick Cassidy is the kind of guy, he doesn't need to be starting the front of the grid. So I think all of these past stats mean very little for Nick. Career titles, two. I know how good Nick Cassidy was in Japan. Oh. And he's won five titles up until now. And I think that's exactly what Aga needs to deal with the pressure when it comes to the last two rounds. I think where that leaves us currently is Jake is up by one. Which pretty much, it, it, it kind of matches the, the championship ranking. So true. So we didn't really expect the stats to be any different than that. Yeah. But I think I got one little no, trick up my leave sleeve. It there, leave it there. What about the teammates, mate? Oh, I was really hoping you weren't going to bring that because up. Because I've okay. got a four time Le Mans winner, Sebastian Buemi. Do you know what I'm really annoyed about? You my can't go to stat <laughs> about Andre Lotterer is that he's won Le Mans three times. Well, there you go, mate. I reckon we'll, we'll, we'll end that one on, on equal terms, or? It's a tie. And we're going to have to settle this in other, other means. How? We've got a chessboard, so should I do the honors? Your move. And we both have no clue what Check we're doing. Checkmate. <laughs> the atmosphere is, I have to say, absolutely frothing right now. And in terms of the championship standings, we've got the likes of Cassidy, Verline, Dennis. They've got an awful lot to do to try and overtake Sasha Fenestras, who's currently P4. Possibly in some of the best racing of his life. Sam Bird is going to play tactics, and the upshot of that is we could maybe potentially see some mistakes and accidents, which is what we saw in qualifying with Jake Hughes, Ollie. Yes, a uh, unfortunate situation for Jake Hughes going through the very fast um, turn five and six. You can hear here, here, here. He just bottomed, uh, bottomed out, lost control of the car, and once he's in the the, the, um, the marbles, he just completely lost grip and. Yeah, an unfortunate situation for him. It's a tub damage, so he will not be participating in this race. He'll be focusing on repairing that for tomorrow. Do we think he'll make it tomorrow, though? That's the big question, Calvin. That's always the big question. I, know, I do know that they share a, a chassis, basically, with McLaren. So obviously, for logistical reasons, a lot of the teams do that, where they share a tub. I, I have heard that Nissan's actually used that tub already, so it could be a, a role to play for tomorrow. It's not sure that he will be back tomorrow. It'll be interesting to hear from Ian James to find out what he thinks on that one. It'll also be interesting to find out from James Rossiter what he thinks of being on what is essentially a home race for Maserati. Let's head to Saunders now. So I'm here with Maserati MSG team principal James Rossiter. Now this is a big day for you. The first race in Rome for Maserati in, was it 1975, was it? I, it's, I mean, it's too long for me to remember. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, huge day for us. We've got some great grid slots, all to play for, I think. What, what do you think is possible to achieve from here? Because you've got two very pacey drivers. You know, we know what Edo's capable of, we just haven't had the chance to see it yet. Could it be done here when it's sort of a home race for him as well as the team? I think today I've got a gladiator in Edo. He's, uh, he's been on great form all weekend. Uh, we're going to send him to the front early and, uh, and see what we can do. Gladiator in Edo, love to hear it. Well, we look forward to seeing him fight. Thank you.
Kelvin, it's something we haven't necessarily spoken about is the fact that for them, it's a home race, so it's special for many reasons. And Max was in amazing form recently. Yeah, 100%. I mean, obviously on these weekends, you have so many guests, sponsors, partners, they all come here. So for the drivers, a lot of stress. They're often late at night at different sponsorship events doing a presentation. So it, it does weigh on the drivers. Luckily, none of them are involved in the championship fight. So they obviously have that extra capacity for it. As you mentioned, they've had great form in Jakarta. We've got uh, Edo in the, in the hunt up front. So hopefully for the home crowd, he can do something special. And you touched on the championship hunt. If you aren't necessarily Mitch Evans, who's currently pole sitter, if you are in P7, P9, P10, as is the case with Verline, Cassidy, etc., what would success look like for them? Do, you think? do they roll the dice or do they just want points at this stage? Points is step one. You know, they, they cannot afford to fall out of the points, and it's all about risk management starting from those positions. As I said earlier, there's drivers starting outside the top 10 that are just trying to score points, and some of them are fighting for their careers. So lots of storylines going up and down this grid. I think it's going to be a, a jam-packed, um, action-filled race here today. Could the temperature come into this, do you think, Kelvin? It is very hot. I mentioned before, in quality, it got up to 53 degrees as track temperature. Yeah, speaking to a lot of the teams, front uh, powertrain is a big problem, like we saw in Jakarta. So if they end up pushing too hard towards the end of the race, we could see a lot of the powertrains overheating. So that's, again, playing into the strategy. You can't attack too hard, you can't push too much. But obviously for the guys that from, from behind, they're needing to do that. So it's a really a balancing act, not overheating your powertrain, but at the same time making the important moves when they count to get yourself up into the top five. And then, Oli, just to add to that jeopardy, you said to me about 24 hours ago, overtaking becomes tougher and overtaking becomes more energy consuming. Yes, for sure. And if Jake Dennis and, uh, and Nick Cassidy are able to move themselves towards the front of this grid and fight for a win, they're going to get to that point with less energy than we expect Mitch Evans to have. Uh, because, you know, he has clear air. He's able to use his teammate behind him to play some defense. That's what we can expect here today. And Kelvin, he's also got Sam Bird, who's presumably going to make things very difficult and get the elbows out for the rest of the guys. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see how they use Sam if they send him out up front to give him a slipstream, protect him maybe the first couple of laps. I don't really know what Jag's going to do, but it's going to be very interesting how they use Sam and uh, he could be the key point today. When you see the safety car come out, that means it is almost time for the race to get underway. Can Mitch Evans do the unthinkable and make history repeat itself like he did last year? It's time to get the Rome E-Prix underway. Well, drivers are lined up, ready to go for action here ahead of the 13th round of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. Just under five minutes to go until race time begins. Amazingly hot here in Rome as well, both on the ground in terms of the track temperatures and indeed the air temperatures uh, here, Alan McNish. Getting up for 60 degrees out there on the tarmac on track. Yes, it is. It's very, very hot, and that's something that I think the drivers and the teams are going to uh, have to really consider for this race for the tyre, for the driver cooling, but also for the way that they recover energy. And so it's definitely put a curveball into this particular afternoon. The track temperature you mentioned there, 60 degrees. It was at 30 degrees when they finished their free practice this morning. And so it's a tremendous change. And I think that will bring a different dynamic with some of the cars maybe coming to the fore that we didn't see before. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to getting underway very shortly here. of the 2023 ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. It's time for the 2023 Hankook Rome E3. Scorching conditions here this weekend. A man on pole who we're expecting to take the fight at the front and very much in the title fight as well. It is going to be a hugely exciting affair out on track over the course of the 25 lap race here this afternoon. My name is Tom Brooks. Alongside me, Alan McNish here to guide you through the action around this rope circuit. Talk us through it, Alan. 
It's the longest lap that we have in this season's Formula E Championship. It's got three really distinct sectors, but certain areas to look at. Turn seven, hard braking, very, very bumpy. Uphill there, a lot of incidents. Then the attack mode around the long turn 15, around the obelisk. And so they'll see overtaking there, and we'll see them using it. But then finally, the last corner, turn three. Now that's cut a lot of people out who have touched the wall in previous years. Altogether, it's a very fast, it's a dynamic, and it's a very different style of circuit. Absolutely. Well, here is the starting grid ahead of the 13th round of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. You see Sergei Seto camera at the back of the grid. Andre Lotterer lines up on the 11th row with Roberto Meri alongside. Next up is the Neo 333 of Dan Tictum. Robin Frines in the Apt Cupra lining up 17th on the grid. Then it is Jean-Eric Byrne and the DS Penske. He has got Lucas Degrassi with Mahindra alongside of the company. Then we have Nico Muller on the grid in the Apt Cupra. He has got Antonio Felix de Costa. He'll be disappointed lining up 13th on the the field. Stopper Van Dorn is P12 with Norman Natto for company alongside him in the Nissan. Pascal Verlein in the top 10. His third top 10 qualifying in five races. Nick Cassidy, championship protagonist alongside. Then it's Maxi Gunter, Jake Dennis down in seventh place in the Avalanche Andretti. Not where he wanted to start. Edin Mortara is on the next row of the grid. Rene Rass there, his fourth top five qualifying in 2023. Sebastian Buemi, his best qualifying for Berlin, lines up P4 with Sasha Fenestras for company alongside. And then the front row of the grid, it is a Jaguar TCS Racing Lockout. Sam Bird lines up second, but once again on a pole position here in Rome, it is the Kiwi, Mitch Evans. He needs a strong result here today to take the title fight to the front. Four drivers going for the title battle in 2023, and Jake Dennis very much at the helm. This is Sam Bird. Wasn't actually sure if he was going to be competing in the duels after his lap was deleted from qualifying, then later reinstated. He got himself into the duels and he gets himself on the front row of the grid. But this man here did the double here last year, Alan. He'll be hoping to for similar fortunes ahead of round 13. Exactly, and that'll bring him right into the title fight, as you said. He did everything perfectly this morning. He was fast in all the sessions and then delivered that killer blow at the end of the uh, qualifying with his teammate and put himself in a perfect place. But I have to say, it's not just like Last year, when he had the double victory, he's also won round here before. Three victories, so he knows it, he knows the feeling, and he understands what works at this circuit and what it takes to win. It's a relatively long run to the grid. They go from the dummy grid, then they make their way all the way over to the starting grid, actually go past the finish line here. It's about 0.8 of a kilometre. Uh, from a driver's perspective, what's going through your mind in the build-up, in the anticipation to the start? Well, the anticipation and build-up's all before they left the dummy grid. Now it's about just preparation, making sure all the settings are absolutely correct for the start, using as little energy as they can on the roll down the hill towards what will be turn three when we get racing, but it's the last corner before they line up in the grid in that long run towards the first corner at turn four. Well, 21 drivers taking to the field. Sadly, Jake Hughes not able to make his way onto the grid following a heavy crash in qualifying. The car has got to be rebuilt. Not enough time to do it between qualifying and the races. And as such, that is why we have only got one Neon McLaren lining up in the field in the form of Rene Rast, who will start from the third row in fifth place. So, the two Jaguar TCS racing machines line up at the head of the field. Here is the view from Sebastian Buemi's machine from the second row of the grid. A few burnouts taking place here, getting some heat into the tyres. And penny for the thoughts of this man here, Jake Dennis, lining up P7. Yeah, he's in a position where, for him, it's maybe not necessarily about the victory, but it's about claiming as many points as possible. And uh, he's leading the championship just by one point over Nick Cassidy, who's also just behind him. As now, Seti Camera just lines up very much at the back. In fact, so far, it's difficult for him to see the lights. Well, it is all action stations then as we get ready to go racing here in Rome. 25 laps ahead of the drivers as they line up. The green flag is waved at the back. It is all eyes then to the lights. As James Barkley looks on, five red lights about to come on. 25 laps of racing action here in Rome. Lights out and we're underway. Good start from Mitch Evans on pole position. Not bad from Sam Bird away from the grid. Keep an eye out for Sasha Fenestras in the Nissan. Down towards the first corner. Jake Dennis running over the long outside line there. He tries to challenge Sebastian Buemi but gets the nose chopped off. Bit of contact there between Buemi and Rene Rast through the first corner. They almost make it relatively cleanly through turn one but looks like Sebastian Buemi's in a bit of trouble here. Yeah, there's a little bit of a problem there. The car's moving around underneath him and uh, he's now having to defend from Eduardo Matara in the, uh, in the Maserati. He's coming down the inside. That's going to be really tight but he's kind of made it. However, that's... Oh. 
That's yeah. left. Uh, then we've got Cassidy who's been able to make up as now Mortara gets it done, finally going into the next one. Oh, three wide into there as well. One of the Maseratis, that's Gunter, being held out to dry on the outside there. They just managed to thread the eye of a needle, but the two Jaguars leading the way. And look at the lead that now it is Sam Bird has managed to get over Mitch Evans. So the two Jaguars have swapped places at the front of this race. And it goes from Sam Bird now leading the race from Mitch Evans, from Sasha Fenestras, from Rene Rats as they come through into the middle sector and into the attack mode sector for the first time. Yeah, one person that's lost out a little bit in all that kerfuffle at the beginning is actually Pascal Verlein of the championship contenders. He's down in fourth, Cassidy is in sixth, Dennis is in fifth, and Sam Bird is uh, leading with his teammate Mitch Evans, who's the one that really needs the points, is in second. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is going to be hugely interesting to see how it plays out in the opening stages of this race. The two Maseratis were incredibly close uh, to one another. It was actually Eddie Mortara who lost out on the outside in that drama in the opening sector. We saw him going side by side with Cassidy and then also Gunter on the inside of that corner. But they all managed to make it through facing in the right direction. You can see the winners and losers at the end of the first lap. Sam Bird it is that leads the way. Mitch Evans relegated now down into uh, second place. Sasha Fenestras whole station in third from Rene Rast. Yeah, Rast is getting pretty punchy there. He's locked onto the back of Fenestras very quickly as one of the Neos comes down the inside of Andre Lotterer overtaking Lotterer. Now, Lotterer is the teammate to Jake Dennis. Dennis is up in fifth, and Andre is down at the back in 18th. Not been a good day for him starting 20th. Yeah, he needs to try and play a supporting role here as Andre Lotterer, but down in 17th on the grid is not the way that he'll be wanting to do that, and indeed not what Avalanche Andretti will need in the opening stages of this race. Further down the order, you can see the drivers filtering through, and the top five, look at they put a bit of daylight between themselves and Nick Cassidy there in the Envision. So work to do here for Cassidy to try and close down that deficit. Yeah, but he's got to be kind and gentle because at the moment he's got a good position. He's got a little bit of a gap up to Dennis. At the moment, Bird is kind of backing everybody up because Evans is right on the back of him. And then it's Fenestras, Rast and Dennis. And so from that point of view, I think Nick Cassidy's just got to play the longer game. And there's a bit of damage there. Fairline, championship contender, has got some damage. Front wing is there and he's now being overtaken. Oh, Pascal Verline go past him is Nico Muller. Then Dan Tickton follows him through. So that is a disaster for Pascal Verline. So, problems for the Porsche in the opening stages of the race. He's going to have to box. I think with that front wing there, we remember what happened to Nico Muller in Portland. He got lodged under the car and he had an almighty shunt. And so they're going to have to box him now. Yeah, look at that. He's absolutely no grip on the front end of that Porsche. Let's see if we can piece together exactly what happened here for uh, Pascal Verline. So we're on the run into, what is that, turn seven? Yeah, coming up into turn seven and look a little bit further back and as it's all sort of concertinoing. And this is at the race start, and there he gets caught. He just basically trips over the car ahead here. We're on board with him now. And yeah. turning it, and it's just with the concertina effect, and he knocks his nose there. Yeah, that's out of Mortara, I think, that he went into. I wonder if Mortara sustained a little bit of damage from that. It was so close and so frenetic in those first couple of corners, but drama then for Pascal Verline. Meanwhile, as he comes into the pit, so he has now decided to box, and that's, uh, well, he's got no choice, has he, really, with that Tag Heuer Porsche. The team now going to have to take the front wing off, get it back on, but that's going to mean that any meaningful result that the German can get from this race is effectively run, and it's only lap two. Yeah, and it was Maxi Gunther was the one that was checking up there with Buemi, and ultimately that was the one that he hit, but now it's still bird leading from Evans and Fenestras, Rast Dennis, and there you can see that uh, you've got Cassidy, who's still just sitting with a watching brief. I was just wondering about the positions here between the Jaguars and Bird and Evans. Now, Bird obviously got through on the first lap. Do you think there might be a bit of team tactics going on here? Yeah, there's no question. He's, they're basically, what will be happening right now is Evans will be conserving as much of the energy in his battery as possible. And here's the radio for I Cassidy. I don't have any beep when I push the radio button, so it's my headphones. Yeah, small problem there for Cassidy. Normally when you press the radio button, it gives a little audio beep, so you know you've actually activated that but he doesn't have it and so it's just something you'll get very used to very very quickly but what Bird is doing is punching a hole in the air allowing then Evans to conserve a little bit more energy and at some point I'm very sure that Evans will overtake uh, Bird will move aside and then Evans will use that extra energy probably around about the attack mode phase to then go ahead well, running on board, we are here with Sam Bird, then followed by his teammate Mitch Evans, then closes Sasha Fenestras. Jake Dennis still very much in touching distance as they come down the start finish straight. Lap three out of 25, we are on. There is Nick Cassidy in the envision, following him closely 
is Max Gunter in the Maserati home race here for Maserati. They'll be hoping for a strong result here this weekend. The two Jags looking uh, pretty close to one another, and you wonder here whether Mitch Evans is going to try and pounce on his teammates. He's very close indeed on the run in towards turn seven. He goes to the inside line. Can he get his way up the inside? No, not quite. They've got to be careful, these two Jaguars. They've come together twice this season. They don't want to make it a hat trick. Yeah, the other thing is that up into there, it's very, very bumpy, and it's quite easy to lose control. We've seen a lot of people locking up and making mistakes. There's definitely easier places is to do it as one of the cars is stopped at turn six looks like there's maybe been an incident at oh six. there we go that's Lutter. Andre Lutter who's gone out unfortunately of the race he's clattered into the barrier that's going to be yellow flag if not possibly a safety car I mean they are at an opening here in the wall safety car is out then yeah without doubt that seems to be a very similar incident through the very fast and bumpy turn six up the hill and uh, he's obviously had some reason to hit the wall Oh, a big shame there for Andre Lotter. So the race is now neutralised as the drivers uh, go round. And that means no overtaking at this point as well. So the, the race does come to a small sort of break at the moment as we wait to see what is going to happen in terms of the recovery of Lotter. Something went under my car. It's been a team radio there from Lotter saying that it was an issue with the car. So, not good there for Andre Lotterer. He is out on the race on lap three. Now, what is this going to mean in terms of uh, energy management here for, for the drivers, Alan? Because obviously now we've got the safety car, all the strategies go out the window. Come back to that in a moment. Let's have a look at the incident here with Lotterer. Yeah, this is at the end of the incident, so he's already been into the wall at this point and kicking up a lot of uh, debris there. He's a uh, passenger just waiting on the, the car to slow down right now. Andre will be fine, I'm very sure from that, but the, the Avalanche Andretti car is certainly not. It doesn't support their other driver, Jake Dennis, at all. He's kicking up leaves as he goes into the wall at turn six. So just going back to that earlier question of uh, energy management now, Alan, so what does it mean at, uh, at this point now for the, for the teams of the drivers? Do they have to rethink their strategies? No, not necessarily at this moment in time because uh, there'll be laps added on at the end, which is equivalent to the energy that they have kind of saved under the safety car, so you get the same end result. And so right now we're in a position where uh, everybody's just sort of calming down, looking at the tyre temperatures, that's one thing. As well from the, from the recuperation systems as well, they'll be getting a little bit cooler. However, it's not really cool, is it? It's 33 degrees out there as Andre now is getting out of the car. Yeah, Andre Lotterer, pointless in the last four races, including this one here today. A huge shame for the German driver. see how the rest of the race is going to work out for the Andretti team. Is the car okay so far? All sensible? Yep, feeling, feeling good. Team radio there for Mitch Evans just confirming that the car is all okay and that he is looking absolutely fine out on track at the moment as he sits in second place behind his teammate Sam Bird. Let's have a look at the restart of the start of this race then. So the two Jaguars leading the way. Good start from Mitch Evans initially. Not bad from Sam Bird off the front row of the grid too. Everyone else getting away relatively nicely. Let's have another look, see if we can uh, piece together exactly what happened because it all got a bit frenetic down towards that first turn, didn't it? Yeah, it's just uh, basically allowing him down the inside into the first corner because certainly from an acceleration and an initial launch point of view, Evans was easily the equal. Ross there trying to go around the outside of uh, Sebastian Bohemia, managing to make that stick. He then in turn lost a place to Jake Dennis as they come through six and into seven. So not a good start to the race there for Sebastian Bohemia. The run up into turn seven was always going to be the exciting pair. So Rasco's defensive there, slight lock up just in front of him. They almost have filtered through. Dennis and Ras side by side coming through that left hander. And then it all sort of got a bit messy into the next series of turns. We saw the Maseratis just at the bottom of your picture there with uh, Cassidy in the middle going three wide in to uh, the next corner. It pinches up into these corners as well and it gets very narrow and there's only one point that you actually turn into. Sebastian Buemi here who started uh, fourth on the grid and as you see defending moving around and there's a bit of a lock up and uh, you see Rast on the right hand side there they have a little bit of a touch but then they continue. Look at it, it's just touching all the way up the hill and uh, this is at the point where on the bumps you see Buemi just lost the rear quite a lot. Massive armful of lock there for Sebastian Buemi. Lucky to keep hold of the car. That's good news. Safety car in. 
So confirmation then that the safety car will come in at the end of this lap. At the end of lap four, we are going to resume uh, racing action here. Now the pace setter is Sam Bird, followed by Mitch Evans. This now means that the gaps that had slightly opened up in the opening stages of the race have now shrunk down. And what it's going to mean is that Mitch Evans is going to be punching a hole in the air for... Uh, sorry, uh, Sam Bird is going to be hunching, punching a hole in the air for teammate Mitch Evans. Team Tax is going to come into play, but it might leave either of them under attack in the opening stages of this restart. So green flag is out. We are ready to get racing action back underway on lap four of round 13 of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship here in Rome. So Sam Bird leads the field across the timing line. Green flag is out. Mitch Evans follows him close in tow behind. Good restart for the two Jaguars there. They built just a tiny bit of daylight between themselves. Might not leave them under attack in the first couple of corners, but it's the heavy braking zone of turn four where we'll see anybody trying to make a move but yeah relatively clean for the time being yeah everybody's just sort of slotted in interesting for me is that Cassidy didn't really have a think about the attack there he's quite happy to sit behind Jake Dennis he was one and a half seconds behind before that uh, safety guard phase and he's just sitting there now trying to do exactly what Dennis is doing to Rast is just conserving that little bit of energy for deployment later on. Oh, here we go. The two Jaguars then are going to be changing places here. Looks like Mitch Evans is going to go through on teammate Sam Bird. He does up in the hill in towards turn seven. So it's a change at the front as the Kiwi now leads. And the question is, is he going to be a, try and build a gap or is he just going to sit there and try and back the pack up as it stands in the early stages of this race? No one making any sort of meaningful moves in the uh, middle of the pack at the moment. They all run relatively close on another nose to tail through this mid-sector of the lap. And in towards the turn 12 and 13, Chicane threading the eye of a needle through there as we come in towards the, the next right-hander, which follows. This is turn 14. You can see the cable camera giving you a fantastic bird's-eye shot of the drivers as they filter their way through. Of course, tyre pressures would have gone down ever so slightly now that they're running... Uh, at, or were running at a slower pace under the safety car. Driver's eye view here from Sebastian Buemi. You can just see how challenging this row circuit is. Buemi in the mix there, and you can see a few drivers going for the attack mode there. So Sergio sets a camera, Robin Fright, and crucially, Pascal Verline. Verline right at the back of the field. They've got eight minutes of attack mode available, and you can see their Verline going for six minutes early doors. Yeah, going for six minutes. Look for Verline now. It's a case of he's got to do something, and he's got to do something a little bit different. And uh, that's the right thing. No one up at the front has taken it this early, uh, very much unlike previous races where they're trying to get rid of them straight away. And so uh, right now, Verline is uh, he's basically trying to get anywhere near that top ten. It'll still be a very, very tough ask. Yeah, absolutely. You can see the attack modes remaining, the amount of time they've got remaining on the left-hand side of your screen. So Verline trying to make hay whilst the sun shines. No surprise there at all. I suppose the one saving grace for him is he was right at the back of the field following that pit stop for the change of the front wing. The safety car would have him closer into the pack here. Meanwhile, look at this. Yeah, and uh, that's Fenestras that's now managed to get up into second. So Fenestras has leapfrogged Sam Bird, and so the defence mechanism from uh, the second of the Jaguars seems to have dropped off for some reason. Yeah, not working at all for Sam Bird in the opening stages. Is that going to possibly leave him under threat from Rene Rast? The McLarens have been struggling with traction, but Rast holding his own there at the moment in fourth place is the German driver. And let's see what he is going to be able to do if he might be able to launch an attack on the Briton. Riding on board, we are through turn 12 and 13 as they come through in towards the uh, middle sector of the lap. Lap 6 out of 25, we are on. You can see their attack mode remaining for a few of the drivers. Muller, Freins and Sete Camera went for two minutes in their sort of early stages, which kind of would have cancelled out Verlines at the moment, but he's got another four minutes now remaining. Other drivers going into attack mode, so that's Dan Tictum in the Neo, and closely followed is the Mahindra as well of Roberto Meri. Again, uh, not necessarily any of the front runners. They are trying to find the right position before they do anything with the attack mode. Uh, Dennis is radio. Ras deploy more into seven. Rast is deploying more of the energy up into turn seven. That's where most of the overtaking has happened so far. And so he's using that. He'll be using less somewhere else in the lap. But that means that Dennis can also not necessarily attack into that one overtaking opportunity area because ultimately Rast is just a bit too quick there. 
Norman Nato just having a half look there on Sebastian Buemi for eighth place. They came down in towards the first corner. No room at the end, though, for Nato at the moment. Playing rear gunner to uh, his teammate, Sasha Fenestras. Oh. Meanwhile, here we go with Rene Rast making a move. Let's see whether he's going to be able to make it on Sam Bird. He does, so Rast now up into third. Bird going to get down to fourth. We've got moves being made here as well. Up the inside comes the Porsche. Does he go through? Yes, he does. Good move there from Antonio Felix da Costa into 10th place ahead of... Uh, into 9th place now ahead of Norman Nato. Yeah, da Costa's got to try to do something to take points away from uh, some of the main contenders in the championship, if at all possible, in the same way that he did in Portland just a few weeks ago. And that will hopefully, for them, help their line. Here's the Jagger. And attack to fall behind Sasha. Push into attack this lap, so he's going to come into attack mode and then fall behind Sasha Fenestras. And uh, that will mean that Evans got one done, and he does exactly that. Yeah, so he's going to fall oh, behind. But he's got to drop behind Rast as oh, well. It's really close, isn't it? Really, really close. They just manages to get ahead of the McLaren. That's pretty crucial here for him at this early stage. Does he manage to stay ahead into the right hander? Yes, he does. So, really important there, early stages for Mitch Evans. Yeah, it's very important, and it's because it is a reasonable run into the next one, you can get some momentum, and actually, even though you come out the corner half behind the car ahead, you can overtake them before the next right hander. Exactly what happened there for Mitch Evans. You see the top four now with a little bit of daylight between themselves and the uh, rest of the field. That is Jake Dennis, who uh, sits in fifth position at the moment. You wonder whether Dennis is going to go for his first dose of attack mode early stages. Team radio for Dennis. Let's close this gap to Bird. So simple instructions there for Jake Dennis. Close the gap down to Sandberg. What's it sitting at at the moment? Uh, only about a second. About a second, isn't it? Yeah. So he's just going to try and uh, try and close that down. Do you think he might use attack mode to do so? No, I think what he'll do is just use a little bit more energy and attack a little bit more. That okay? That builds a little bit of temperature into the tire, um, but ultimately he'll just do that so he's in a position. We're generally deploying more at T4. So you're aware. Oh, Edo Mortara gets it all crossed up, trying to make a move on Norman Nato, cost them both ultimately in that one, they, they'll drop down, possibly now a bit under threat here, because up the inside goes the uh, DS Penske as they make the move, so the DS Penske of uh, John Eric Verne now moving ahead. Yeah, but that, that move, always when you're so close up to the wall on the inside, it's very difficult to get it stopped and to get it turned. First look at the energy here then, and the graphic on the left-hand side of your screen, that's the first time the teams will have looked at it as well. Uh, Jake Dennis, Nick Cassidy with just a percent more than the remainder of the field in front of them at the moment. And as Fenestras and Rask goes into the attack mode, followed by, um, followed by Sam Burke, but you saw there as well, Fenestras was 2% less than Evans on energy already. Here comes Bird then, looking up the inside of Jake Dennis, manages to make the move stick into the uh, right-hander of 16. Nice move there for him. So Dennis is the only driver now inside the top five who hasn't got the active attack mode. Evans' is one just runs out. High coolant temp. It's a high coolant temp, I think he was saying something along the lines of that. Yep, so high cool intent there for uh, Mitch Evans. So just something for him to watch and the team to keep an eye on. But uh, Evans with his first dose of attack mode, he's now out. Could possibly leave him under a bit of threat here from René Rast, who's got five minutes in the bank. Yeah, five minutes in the bank, but then that will come round later on. So from that perspective, it's all about positioning at this moment in time. They've not taken the full allocation of attack mode. That's eight minutes over the course of the race, and it can be done in different sectors. But uh, from that point of view, it's positioning right now. Fenestras leading Evans, leading Rast. Yellow flag is out, that's down at turn six, so that's a fast part of the track. Yeah, it's another sure. crash, it's, it's a Jaguar. Jaguar, it's Sam Bird! Sam Bird has crashed out, oh, oh. no, that's absolutely huge, Sebastian Moemi into the side of him, red flag is immediately out on lap nine out of 25, and Sam Bird crashed out, nowhere to go for Sebastian Buemi, we only caught the end of the incident, but that's a hugely fast part of the circuit to crash at as well, and, and you can see another driver involved as well. Indra. There's a Mahindra in there it as is, well, yeah. and this looks a blue car, kind of looks to me like it could be... Uh, it's a Maserati, I Maserati, think, yeah. yeah I could think be Mortara. Could be a Mortara, so absolutely a huge incident. It's, it's uh, Edwin Mortara, yeah, the other driver who's involved in that. You can see an onboard of him, well, his visor's open, and uh, concerned faces down at the Maserati garage, OK? Sam Burke saying he's OK following that incident, which is what we like to see and now we wait for uh, any further news and there's a Porsche involved here as well is that Felix da Costa that's got involved yes I in think it's I think it uh, probably is it is yeah Antonio yeah. Felix da Costa the 2020 
champion is out of this race. So that really oh. did cause a massive concertina effect up and down the field. Huge crash here on lap nine. Wait for further news. Sebastian Buemi is up and out of his Envision car here, Alan. Yeah, and it's also another factor that the team will be considering as a reminder, away. the red light procedure and is also for the race in front tomorrow. of your garage or you go into yeah, your garage see. if you require repairs in front or into. So if you go into the garage, this is the race director that's telling everybody else, if you then come back and they'll line up in the pit lane, if you stay in the pit lane, you're in order. If you need to have work done to your car and you have to go in the garage, you've got to go to the back of the line and line up. So even if you're second or third and you've got a little bit of damage, you then have to line up at the back. Well, we only saw the incident on board there from Sam Bird when he was collected. We didn't see the remaining incident as it unfolded, but the track absolutely littered with carbon fiber, body parts in there as well. And Sam Bird out of the car, Edo Martara just waiting there. He's now taking the wheel off. Looks to be okay, but uh, because uh, they're just protection and they always do that where they try to ensure that everybody is fine and everything is fine before the drivers are released and the safety car is there in the medical car. Yeah, just heard on team radio that all drivers are okay following that crash, but goodness me, this is gonna be some cleanup operation uh, here in Rome before we could get racing action resuming and well penny for the thoughts of Sam Bird at the moment we didn't see exactly what happened whether it was a, a problem with the car or whether he made an error let's have a look on board and see if we can piece together exactly what happened here Alan it's turn six where it all occurs yeah the car is already dancing around but as it does every single lap uh, he's just wide Sam's wide and he's over the crest and as he spins round, it's there that he's moving around and the impact's behind. The people behind have got a very narrow area where they can maybe get it through. Or oh, we didn't see the first part of that, so we only saw the Maserati of Mortara going into him there, but we didn't see exactly what happened up no, the road. Boemi tagged him yeah. earlier on, so the people that were on the right, the left-hand side of the circuit tagged the front of the car, and then Mortara hit the back of the car. Yeah. And so here we are on board with Boemi. And so this is a driver's eye view of the incident coming up ahead. And Sam is just two cars up, he gets a little bit wide into the wall, and as you see, it's pretty blind coming through here. Yeah, and yeah there's very little for him to do, the car's up, the wheel's up in there, and then it's a concertina effect from there, because that then is like a pinball, it spins the car in and around, and there's a very heavy hit. Yeah, Mortara with absolutely nowhere to go in that one as well. Well, that has certainly reduce the number of cars that will be taking to the restart in this race when we get it back underway. So there's the first incident for Sam Bird, clipped by Seb Buemi into the wall. Well, more than clipped, it was a yeah. pretty heavy hit and also the Porsche behind him as well locked up and that's where we saw uh, the Porsche hitting and the Costa. And at this point as well, Jean-Eric Verne, I think it is there. In fact, one of the DSs goes left, one goes right, but the one that went right there hit the right rear wheel as well. Oh, and then Mortara just completely unsighted through there, slams on the brakes at the last possible moment. That's really, really violent. One of the Mahindras involved there as well. You can see Felix da Costa's uh, Porsche up the road. Just important to let you know, oh, that's one of the app Coopers and Nico Muller, yeah. I think, isn't it? That's also ended up in some strife. Important to mention that all drivers are OK following this incident of what is an almighty accident on the streets of Rome. Look at the amount of cars. Lap nine out of 25 we're on, so not even half race distance at this point. And well, the face says it all here for James Barkley, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's uh, that's a pretty serious impact. And as I said, the teams will be thinking about the effect and repercussions for today for this race for the championship, but also to make sure the cars are repaired for tomorrow. Nick Cassidy now in the box. He was fifth when the red flag came out. Of course, we've got no Sandberg. He will not be making the restart. So that is going to promote Maxi Gunter up the order as well, quite possibly, depending on if he's got any damage on his car. Well, that's the thing. We've got to now wait and see what the damage is because there was so much debris there and people just clipping the wall in the left and the right as they were trying to make their way past. It was pure 100% just instantaneous reactions that got them out of what was a very tricky situation when they did. Some of them just unfortunately didn't quite make it. No, well, back into the Jaguar garage. This is Mitch Evans, and 
for the drivers that had deployed their attack mode or were in active use of attack mode, what does that mean? That means it just runs down. That's unfortunately the bad luck of the situation. And there's Andre Lotter who had an incident at that corner earlier on. He's just uh, taking the opportunity to be able to now go back to the pits. But uh, for them that had activated attack mode and whatever was left, so Pascal Verlein, I think, had six minutes that he attacked. Uh, if he had four minutes left, then it just ran down naturally and you would not get that back. Well, that is going to leave some at a disadvantage once the race restarts. There's Nico Muller in the Apt Cooper making his way back to the pit lane. A rotten weekend have the Apt Coopers, as of all of them, in Hindra powered cars. Yeah, I think that's actually Robin Thrines, actually. I beg your pardon, you're that's, right. Uh, that's involved in that. We saw that one of the Apt Coopers tagging with the right rear against the nose of Sam Bird's car, and it looks like it could have been Robin. Well, there we are. You can see. This is Sam's so now, we, so now we can see on our monitor, so basically involved in this, Sam Bird, Sebastian Buemi, Antonio Felix da Costa, Edard, Eduardo Matara, Lucas de Grassi and Robin Freins. So well, there we have the Mahindra of Lucas de Grassi. Yeah, it's a shame for Lucas, he hasn't had a particularly fortuitous weekend thus far. On the other side of the coin is Mitch Evans. Uh, well, he was sitting second at the time that that red flag came out. Sesha Penestra, or Sesha Penestra as it was, who was uh, leading the race, having deployed his attack mode. I think the big question now from uh, their point of view is exactly how do they play this restart? Let's head down to Saunders, shall we, and get an update. Yes, thank you very much, guys. Now, obviously, we go without saying that the, most, the thing of most importance is that to see all drivers are out of the car and that everyone's OK. But I just want you to have a little spin around this pit lane and seeing how quiet it is, purely because I can count 10 cars in the pit lane out of 22. So that just gives you an indication of how many cars were involved in this incident. And I think I have to say it's one of the worst incidents I think I've seen uh, in my time in Formula E. So even more glad to hear that everybody is OK. Now, this, of course, has ramifications on the race, but it also has huge ramifications on the championship because as Razzi pointed out to me just shortly ago almost everybody involved in terms of the team's championship the opposite end of the garage trying to make up points for their uh, their team partner doing well in the team in the drivers championship is now out of this race so this is major amount of points lost for teams like Envision for Jaguar for Porsche and for Andretti so yeah this is a, a big thing to happen of course but has huge ramifications in the championship as well as the race yeah, cheers, Saunders. Really good point there, actually, isn't it? Of course, ramifications for the for the team's championships as uh, some of the drivers. There's Lucas Degrassi for Mahindra just getting his way into the car. Uh, I think there's uh, yeah, quite a few that <laughs> first squished themselves into the back of the car, waiting to get back into the pit lane as his stricken Mahindra is airlifted away from the circuit as we await further information on when the race will resume. At the time that the red flag came out, there were 17 laps that still left to run. You wonder whether we'll get a slightly reduced race distance and what the procedure is going to be. And James Barkley now has no rear gunner here in this race. Sam Bird was playing the team game for Jaguar TCS Racing. And now, of course, Sam Bird is very much out of the race. And this is going to be really important also here for Pascal Verlaine. You saw the Porsche team there just working away on his car. And this could possibly save Verlaine's race. At the time of the red flag came out, he was 14th. But what's that? One, two, three, four cars up the road from him have retired because they were involved in that incident. So that then de facto means that he's 10th. Essentially, so yeah, this could be important. Let's have another look. So this is Bird's crash. The way he goes into the back of it there as well. Got to see the effect. Oh, and that's Mortara. That's the one that's really, really nasty. Robin Freint involved in there, and uh, Lucas Degrassi on board. We'll see it once again here from Bird's point of view. So just a little bit wide going through into six. Clips the wall on the outside. At this point, he's now a passenger. Nothing he can do. Gets clipped by Buemi really quite violently. Lots of carbon fibre stricken over the track. And then wait for the secondary impact. And there you go. Bang. Edo Mortara straight to the scene of the crash in the Maserati. 
Let's have a listen to some team radio. Let's have a listen to when the When is this lock gonna f*** up? So, Buemi then, clearly frustrated following that. Let's have another look at the driver's eye view of exactly what happened there. So he's coming through. Oh, so unsighted. Massive impact into the side of Boemi. Thankful for the halo in these circumstances as well, just stopping the, the wheel, the carbon fibre, going directly into his eye line. He emerges from the car frustrated, but crucially, up and OK following that incident, which could be far, far worse. And you can see there as well, Porsche of Felix Costa, who was crabbing his way down after being involved in that very, very big hit. I thought we might see uh, Mortara just clipping the back of, of uh, uh, Sam Bird, but no dice for him, no dice for this man here, Sebastian Buemi. His first retirement of the 2023 season, he'll be disappointed with that, but again, given the severity of the impact, he'll be frustrated. Thumbs up to the camera as he walks his way back through pit lane, but the body language says it always very clearly frustrated. And uh, disappointment there for him because, of course, we were talking about Sam Bird playing the rear gunner role to Mitch Evans, but Sebastian Buemi was effectively trying to do the same uh, for Nick Cassidy in that race. So that means that Envision are only going to have one car in the race, as are Jaguar, as are Porsche now, with Pascal Verlein in uh, effectively 10th place because he's 14th, but four cars up the road will not be taking to the restart. So it's a welcome sight here for Pascal Verlein. Great news for him. But nonetheless, disappointment for all the other drivers. Well, with his teammate being one of the cars that's out, so the rear gunner aspect of it's, it's dropped off. But at the same time as well, you have to say that uh, Dennis and Cassidy are now already in strong points and uh, they are two of the leading contenders. Right now, um, there's not very much gain that would come from the positions if it stays as it is right now. However, after the restart and one lap, I think he'll be completely different again. Well, they'll be incredibly grateful that Sam Bird took his attack mode when he did, because, you know, had he been a bit further up the road, you know, third or fourth place, that could potentially have, incident could have involved other drivers, you know, maybe Dennis, maybe Cassidy, and uh, we could be talking about a very different set of circumstances at this point. So now we've got DS to Cheetah. We saw some incident there, and this is jean Eric Vern's car, and they're trying to repair that for the restart. That car made it back round into the pit. It's in the garage, and they're frantically trying to make sure that car is ready by the time this race will restart. restart. Yep, so now the drivers just sit and debrief and discuss exactly what happened from a, a, a team no, a team you, owner point of view what's going on here no you don't discuss anything what happened that's ancient history you discuss what you're doing and what you need to do going forward so right now it would be making sure that the driver is in a position where he's nice and cool and he's able to focus on what he has to do next nothing about the past the past is done it's gone and so therefore it would just be about trying to ensure um, that you are all prepared and making sure that everybody has focus 100% on the next job in hand. Sergio sets a camera here for the Neo 333 team. And here is uh, Pascal Verlein. He'll be possibly hoping for an opportunity. Cool vest on to try and keep his core temperature as low as possible in the sweltering conditions uh, that we've had here in Rome. It's time for the drivers to take a short breather. Yeah, they Incidents at the uh, all the time at the moment. I would imagine just due to the fact that uh, it's uh, such a such a severe incident. Lots of carbon fibre stricken well, over the track, and uh, huh? we'll see well, exactly when we're yeah. likely to get a restart. Interestingly, just having yeah, a look, the longest ever yeah. Formula E race was actually yeah, back here at home in 2019. It's now in 33 minutes and 51 seconds. That was a race that Mitch Evans in the Jaguar won. Yep, um, but you've got various regulations that mandate what the maximum time period that the race can go on for, and uh, that's, I think, three hours from the race start, so I think we're, we're probably going to be okay in that one. Uh, the, yeah. 
Absolutely. You can see so the drivers uh, on the left-hand side of your picture with the graphic that says pit. That means they made it back to the pit lane. If they haven't got that, they're out of the race, effectively. They were involved in that incident. So we say goodbye to Bird, Boemi, De Costa, uh, Mortara, De Grassi, Robin Frines. So, yeah, a plethora of retirements at this stage. But also just want to say a huge credit to the safety of these cars as well. All of those drivers involved in that incident, all emerging OK. Yeah, they're very, very strong in that respect. And, uh, you know, the cars have designed to withstand massive impacts. That's the way that they're constructed. Sasha Fenestras, he was leading as the race was stopped for the, him. They're now looking at what their strategy will be for the next part of it. Yeah, Sasha Fenestras. And Lucas Degrassi, he won't be taking any further part in it with this car. Ended up at uh, turn seven. Yeah, 2017 and champion is Lucas Degrassi. Been involved in Formula E since its inception back in uh, 2013. Long, long time ago now. He's one of the longest serving competitors, as we said. Here is Jake Hughes, who didn't take to the start of this race. He had an almighty shunt in qualifying, actually at the same corner of turn six. Very sort of similar start to the impact there for him. He went a little bit wide through that corner, had one impact with the wall, had an impact on the other side of the wall, and unfortunately damaged the chassis. And that meant that he wasn't able to, to restart the race. I suppose this throws up uh, some questions as well for some teams uh, about getting the cars rebuilt and ready for racing tomorrow. Yeah, 100%, and especially like Edo Mortara there, who is on his way back, because that was a very heavy impact, as it was for Evans. And uh, we saw there that uh, Jake Hughes, now as we understand, they're borrowing a spare chassis from Porsche. Porsche had the Costa in the shunt. Is the Costa chassis damaged? And so now they'll be looking at uh, the main core aspects to it and to see what they need to do. Because the cars are out today, the first thing they'll do is just consider tomorrow and uh, get on with the job of preparation there. Well, Dan Tickton there, just, um, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not even sure where to go with that, to be no, quite honest with you. Don't go anywhere. I, I think we'll leave that there. But, uh, yeah, Dan Tickton just cooling off in the garage at the moment. Big uh, feature in Season 2 of Formula E, Unplugged. Rene Rast, thankfully, not following the same tactic as uh, as Dan Tickton. If you want to watch Formula E Unplugged, it's available on the official Formula E app. You can watch it completely free. And I have to say, it is absolutely thing. tremendous. Oh, Season 2 in particular, I watched it the other day uh, in my hotel room. And uh, really, really impressive. It gives you a great insight into the characters involved in Formula E. And uh, just exactly what sort of effort and hard work goes into being a racing driver, but also it gives you an idea as to exactly what their personalities are like outside of the racing car, crucially as well, as Lucas Degrassi just has a bit of a debrief with his team. Jake Dennis, meanwhile, cool vest on, focus now on the restart, whenever that will prove to be. Just trying to keep his core temperature down, and uh, still the cleanup operation is in place, as it looks like they've got uh, some of Harry Potter's Quidditch sticks out to clear up the debris. Yeah, it's going to be a little while yet, because the problem here is there were so many small carbon shards, and uh, as you now have got the rear view camera of uh, the uh, Maserati looking at the damage of Sandbird's car. It's taken a fair hit. It really has, yeah, but crucially, the, the main points all intact in that car, so he emerges OK. What's going on here? This is Jean-Éric Verne's car. We saw him having the impact and making it back to the pits. And uh, this is the front corner. You see the drive shaft there that, we, that puts the energy uh, under braking back into the electric motor that sits in front of the driver's feet. And then that will go straight back into the battery. And so the MGU will uh, is just sitting into there. That's the question is whether it's damaged or not. Doesn't look like it is, but they are doing a chassis, uh, sorry, the suspension repair on the bottom leg of the wishbone. They're also working a saw on the rear of the car as well. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have to get a little bit of uh, team radio from him in a uh, few moments' time just to see what happens. Here we go. Holy <laughs> that was crazy. Did you pass just the Yeah, that obviously was radio from uh, when he was coming in, not uh, live. 
Yeah, Stoff this is actually Stoffel van Dorn's car that is there, yeah. So it's Stoffel's car, and uh, looking at the other side, that would suggest that John eric Verne's car is OK because it's in the pits and uh, he should be in line. Yeah, so managed to avoid too much drama there, did uh, John eric Verne. He'll be pretty pleased with that. Meanwhile, the other side of the garage, as you can see, a lot of uh, work being done to the reigning champion, D.S. Penske. And now the cleanup operation continues. Here is the view from Maxi Gunter's point of view. We're riding on board with him through turn six, so Burns already had his incidents. And he threads the other needle through the right-hander. It's behind him where it all sort of begins to unfold. This is Pascal Verlein's view. Of, uh, sorry, uh, Antonio Felix de Costa's view. This is quite heavy. Oh! oh. oh. So he actually goes underneath. almost underneath it, doesn't he? Yeah. So on board here with Verlein. Oh, so he took a whack there as well, didn't he? Yeah. He took a whack, but I think it was bodywork that was bouncing over the top of Verline's car. Uh, no, he's got massive steering damage there, right hand down. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go down one. to Radzi, shall we? And find out an update as to what's cracking down there, Radzi. Well, I'm currently just out the Jaguar TCS Racing Garage, joined by, in unfortunate circumstances, Team Principal James Barkley. James, first of all, thank you for your time. Secondly, what's the situation with Sam Bird? Is he OK? Yeah, that's the most important thing. Sam is OK. He's back now. Uh, he had his medical checkup, so that's kind of procedure to take him back uh, to see the doctor and just make sure everything's OK. But yeah, fortunately, he's OK. The other drivers seem to be OK as well. We're just kind of getting reports as they go through the checkups. Uh, yeah, very, a very bad accident. You know, nightmare scenario, really. Fastest part of the circuit on a blind corner. So, yeah, most importantly, the, the car's been strong, it's done its job, and it's protected the drivers. Which is absolutely fantastic news. Thank you for that update. In terms of the team championship, the last time we spoke to you, obviously, it's a very different scenario. It was a front row lockout. Things have all changed. Where's your head up with, with now the race now? Yeah, we always have to reset, and we, we have the restart when it comes. Um, and our job now is, of course, to, uh, to try and, you know, almost start it like a new race um, and, uh, and see, see what we get to. So it's not going to be easy, obviously, this delay. You just need to make sure your process and your procedures that you, you start afresh, you know, and we'll get straight onto Sam's car for tomorrow. Obviously, that's, that's now done for the day. So, yeah, everything's all about making sure we reset and we get ourselves ready for this reset. So you try and mentally and emotionally reset, but obviously in terms of the energy consumption, that is now locked into wherever it is at. So do you take that strategy and carry on or do you have to evolve? Well, of course, you have to, we have to see where we are at that point in time. But, of course, you know, people are on different points on energy at this point. These are all factors we have to take into account, absolutely. But for sure, it's not going to be an easy race. If you look at where everyone is across the field, it's definitely going to be a challenging second part to this race. Thanks so much for your time, Jones. Really, really appreciate it. And glad to see Sam's OK. Thank you. Now, in terms of it, it was a very, very complex incident, it's safe to say, which involved multiple cars, not just Sam, Sebastian Buemi to name but a few. So let's over to Saunders and Ollie right now for a bit more detail on this one. Yeah, thank you very much, Razzi. Uh, joining us in the pit lane studio, Oliver, let's take a look at, I mean, I think you'll agree with me, probably one of the biggest incidents we've seen in Formula E. Yeah, certainly, and one of the most dangerous corners on the calendar. Um, this is a completely blind corner, almost hitting the, the top speed of what this Gen 3 car is capable of. And yeah, as we see here, Sam Bird um, losing control of the car. Uh, we believe he had just gone through attack, so he was also in, the, in the, uh, the higher power and lost the rear once he was in the marbles. It was game over from there. And um, yeah, the, the car is coming behind at, at this velocity. They don't have the, the reaction time and, and the, the space to you know, remove themselves from, from, uh, from danger. This so. is this really, sorry to interrupt, but this is really, you know, I'm just going to take that back just very slightly just to see um, Sebastian Buemi there because you can see he's on a trajectory of actually flipping at this point. Yeah. Um, and, and he does actually go on his side, and, and thank God for um, yeah. you know the safety of this car and, and the halo and everything that's gone into keeping these drivers safe, because um, he was completely on his side. If you play it, um, and Antonio just, Felix just da Costa there, went you? underneath him, so you can see all the debris um, all over the track. And still, this is a blind corner, so cars that are coming here now, yes, the yellow flags are waving, but they still don't have enough time to slow down. They don't know exactly where Sam Bird is sitting. So um, I believe that's John Eric Verne. Just crept through down the inside. That Narrowly, was pure yeah. luck and, and, uh, and, and reaction time. And now we can see in a moment here the big impact with Eduardo Montero going straight on. Huge, and uh, this is stomach churning, really. It's, you know, it goes about saying 
it's very, very uh, warming to know that they're all out of the car. I think it's only Sam Bird that's going for additional checks. Um, but yeah, he, they're all out of the car and OK, thankfully. But again, it's just testament to show how ridiculously robust these cars are, how much they can take. Because like you said, there isn't a, a corner in the calendar that is a worse place to have an impact than what we've just seen here. No, and, and I believe it's eight cars that didn't make it back. Um, could be more than that that did make it back, but have some structural damage to uh, the tires. And uh, it's, going to, it's going to completely change the dynamic of this race moving forward. And I think we have another clip here of uh, to the Buemi view. Yeah, this, this is very, very interesting, obviously going into this. Let's play that here. This just clearly shows how blind this is. And as you see, he goes on his side and how high speed is that? I mean, it happens so quickly. You don't have time just, to react. Let's just take that back and watch that again, uh, if we can, because I want to just slow it down because it happens so fast, obviously. But if we just kind of half speed it now, you can see you know, it just clips that and that's what gives it the rotation. And yeah, I mean, this is, this is terrifying stuff. So, so glad to see that, okay, you mentioned it there. This is going to have huge ramifications on the race, but also on the championship. So it will be interesting to see how this race finishes and what it means for the championship at the end. Yes, it's going to be a very long night for most of the teams um, that were involved in this uh, through, through the paddock. So yeah, the mechanics uh, have, have some work cut out for them to then repair these cars for, for round two here in Rome tomorrow. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the insight as always. Back to you, Ramsey. Thank you, Saunders. Thank you, Ollie. Just to kind of give you guys a sense of the scale of what's happened, there's a real sombre mood, almost a mixture between what you'd see pre-FP1 and possibly on the grid. If we just take a look here, we've got all the cars here with their umbrellas over them, with the cooling systems to keep the powertrains as cool as they possibly can be on both sides of the paddock here. It's a scene that I've never seen before, and it's really created a sense of, I, I guess, reflection and not necessarily excitement, but Kelvin, while the guys were providing that analysis, you made a brilliant point about the turn of fortunes for Pascal Verlein. Yeah, what a roller because a day for him. First of all, not making it into the duels, being at the back of the grid, knocking his front nose cone off early in the race. It looked like he was down and out. It looked like the day was pretty much run for him, zero points. And within a matter of 10 minutes, everything's reset again. So put yourself in his shoes. He's sitting in the back of the box. It's almost like a lifeline now for him. He's got a chance under this red flag to really reflect think about what he can do now to do it better in the second half of the race when it restarts and hopefully save his day pretty much. A brilliant, brilliant point. So he's third in the championship standing so far. He's been inconsistent coming into this. I think one podium in five races and all of a sudden, like you say, crucial points to go deep into the championship. Yeah, we've already mentioned, I mean, so many cars that won't restart this race. So the, the, the chance of being in the points today is very, very high. And he needs to capitalize on that. Um, we see a lot of cars that probably won't start tomorrow. So for every championship contender, there's a big chance here today to, to kind of you know, have this damage limitation moment. Obviously, for, for a Mitch Evans, it's a, it's a least wanted scenario. He wanted as many cars as possible in between him and his championship contenders. But uh, I think for him, he just wants to go out now, reset as well, and hopefully just win this race and do the best that he can. Well said, sir. It's been bad and sad news, obviously, for Sam Bird and a number of other cars. We're very grateful that everyone has walked away, as we understand it so far. A-OK. -okay. But now we can revert our gaze and our attention to the championship because there's crucial points on hand today. And indeed, tomorrow, it is a doubleheader here at Rome. And that in mind, we can hand back to our commentary team of Tom Brooks and Anna McNish. Yeah, thank you very much indeed there, Radzi. So great to hear from the team down on the ground here. In Rome, as the cleanup continues, we will take a very short break in a few moments' time just to wait until we can get action back underway and see when we get the restarted race for round 13 of the ABB FI8 Formula E Championship. Well, as the cleanup continues here for the circuit and the drivers. We now await to see which of the drivers will be uh, taking to the restart. We saw some frantic action in the DS Penske garage trying to get Stoffel van Dorn's machine fixed. This is Jake Dennis, who was in fourth place at the time of the Red Flag Championship protagonist. Championship leader, as a matter of fact, by one point over Nick Cassidy. And he's got sort a of special Rome tribute helmet here this weekend. Fighting like a gladiator, he was out on track and uh, just giving it a quick going over, sorting out some tear-offs, etc. Ready to go for the restart. Sorting out his earplugs there as well. And just making sure everything is good to go. And there is Antonio Felix da Costa, very heavily involved in that instant, was the Porsche driver, both Porsches, in fact, involved in that one. Couldn't have come at a worse time for the 
2020 champion. He was uh, needing to try and play rear gunner to teammate Pascal Verlein in the championship battle, but unfortunately proving to not uh, be the case for him here. So this is going to be really interesting to see what happens when the restart gets underway. And of course, for the drivers who are active in attack mode at the time as well. That really okay, attention does, uh, all teams, attention all teams. This is race control. Interesting. We have effected the majority of the cleanups. At the moment now, I'm giving everyone a 10 minute warning, 10 minute warning. The intention is to restart this race at 16.05. 16.05 is the restart time. So 10 minute warning now as they've managed to get the majority of the cleanup done. So 16.05 local time here in Rome is when they're expecting the race uh, action to begin the res resumption procedure. So now, f from a team point of view, where does that leave them here now, Alan? Well, now they've got to prepare all the system setting. The driver needs to be start to be thinking, because if the race starts in 10 minutes, and it's a 10-minute warning, then you've got to be in the car with five minutes to go. And uh, so that's in five minutes' time. And it's just all of these principles now, because they've been waiting on this 10-minute period. You know it's going to be 10 minutes. And so, therefore, they've just been waiting, and now they will affect all of the different things they have to do in the lead-up to it. Yeah, all the drivers that are going to uh, restart the race, you can see with the pit graphic on the left-hand side of the screen. So that includes Nissan's uh, Sasha Fenestras, Mitch Evans from Jaguar TCS Racing, Rene Rast, uh, Jake Dennis, Nick Cassidy will be in the mix there as well as Max Gunter, Dan Tictum, Nico Muller, Sergio Setacamera, Roberto Meri, Jean-Eric Verne and Stoffel van Dorn. So 21 started this race, yeah. 12 to take to the restart. Yeah, this is... Uh... It's a, definitely going to be a bit of a shake-up. The question I've got is when the cars that were in the pits, like Stoffel van Dorn, for example, if they do finally get him ready, then uh, which position will he be in? What's the actual lineup when it comes to play? Yeah, absolutely. Well, now the action begins again. Our focus is going to shift over to the restart of this race. And let's see what this man here is going to be able to do. You can see the restart order at the bottom of your screen. And we'll run through that a little bit later on in a few moments' time. Interesting, no Verline mentioned there as well. The domino effect of what happened is fairly profound here at the Romy Prix in round 13. I'd like to say delighted to be joined by Sylvain Philippe. Very unfortunate circumstances, obviously TP of Envision Racing. First of all, with Sebastian Buemi, is he OK? How is he so far? Yes, he's uh, physically fine, which is good news. From what I hear, I think all the drivers are OK uh, for now, which is the main thing. Uh, he's extremely annoyed, obviously, uh, not at anyone, but just, uh, yeah, the, the circumstances. It's a really high-speed corner, and as you could see, it's a blind corner. They arrived really fast. They just couldn't do anything. In terms of pragmatism, Kelvin, just off air, you made a really brilliant point about what could potentially happen. Yeah, Sylvan, so we were discussing, and obviously a lot of the teams are sharing chassis, um, just logistically. What is the process for tomorrow? Obviously, Jaguar have the same issue as you guys, very damaged cars. Who gets priority in terms of that? Have you had a chat about that? Like, what, what is the process there? Yeah, there's a, <clears throat> there's a process pre-agreed before the season starts. So we have a pool of spare chassis that we share. And then there's another level of, there's other, we call them like naked chassis, basically, completely unprepared chassis available at uh, the supplier as well, I believe. So, you know, I mean, you look at the state of the cars, I don't think we can keep a single part of that car anyway. I think overnight wow. we'll rebuild a brand new car. Uh, therefore, you know, We'll have new parts anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Hopefully, there will be enough spares for everyone. I don't know that for sure, I hope. Um, but either way, it's an all-nighter for sure to rebuild a new car for tomorrow. We're seeing Mitch Evans obviously get his helmet on without moments away from the race beginning once again. Just on a hum human level, Sylvan, how are you actually feeling personally? Well, we never like to see that. Um, you know, it's a really high speed. We have to remember, I've been in Formula E for nine years, the speed has evolved considerably. These Gen 3 cars are, are some of the fastest race cars on the planet now. So, and the acceleration is so strong, even out of slow corners, they pick up speed and get to 200 kph very rapidly. So any of these turns are actually really high speed. So, you know, credits to the FIA, the safety of the survival cells, really well great said. that the, the drivers are safe. But, you know, when I hear that my car is on fire, it's never a good feeling. So glad everyone is okay.
Thanks for your time. Really appreciate it, Silva. And we now get the race underway in hand. Back to our commentary team of Tom Brooks and Alan McNish. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. There, Rad, you could hear from uh, Sylvain Felipe. We understand that Pascal Verlein, though his car is back in the pit lane and uh, seemingly ready to go, the Porsche team are going to have to ask race control to restart the race as they're in the garage doing repairs and not in the pit lane. So they do expect him to take to the restart, which is why he wasn't mentioned. So it's now been just changing on our timing screen. It's gone from 12 to 13 drivers ready to go for the start of this race as we get ready to get round 13 back underway here in Rome. Well, that's great news then for uh, Pascal Verlein here, Alan, because there was a brief moment of confusion and we were a bit worried that he wasn't going to be able to get himself back onto the grid. Yeah, certainly for Pascal, uh, he's lining up 12th and, uh, you know, that is quite a change from where it was prior to that incident. And so he had a bit of damage um, the, you could see from the onboard that we saw earlier on, the steering was a little bit askew, but uh, now that's been repaired. And he's got, realistically, a very good chance of finishing in the points. It'll be tough to finish very high up the points, but to some extent, a lot better chance than he had maybe 45 minutes ago. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can see the unplugged team down there just getting a few bits of information. Before we get this restart underway, let's head down to Saunders for an update ahead of the next rally of the race. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. There's just a few things I thought would uh, be worth talking about. One is a visual representation of the severity of this incident and how many people it has affected. Now, if you just kind of take a little look at some of the garages, and specifically the empty garages, because it almost feels like for a large part of the grid, at least the top half of the championship, there is at least one car affected from that incident, which, as we've mentioned a few times, is going to have huge ramifications on the team's championship uh, based on the number of points that the other driver can get to the driver that's doing well. That's one thing that visually is just it's quite jarring, if I'm being honest, to see. The second thing was just to follow up a little bit about what Sylvan was saying to the guys there about the spare parts. So there is a, a certain number of spare parts available for the entire grid. Usually it's not a problem when there's one or two incidents, but when you have this many cars involved in one incident and only t less than 24 hours before another race day, bear in mind we've got free practice th three first thing tomorrow morning, it does feel like we could see a potential problem for quite a lot of cars. We, we might see drivers and teams not being able to field a car tomorrow based on lack of spare parts or too much to do overnight. There is also a cutoff to the point where they are allowed to keep working. It's not like they can work from here all the way until free practice tomorrow. So there's all these kind of little sporting regulations and rules which just add to the problem that a lot of these teams and drivers are going to have. So yeah, just a few points that I thought uh, worth mentioning before we uh, get back out on track again. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed there, Saunders. Yeah, ready to get action back underway now here for the restart. Confirmed starting order, you just see in the graphic on the bottom of your screen, means that it'll be Sasha Fenestras who will line up on pole position, followed by Mitch Evans on the front row of the grid. Row two will be René Rast for the Neil McLaren team with Jake Dennis in the Avalanche Andretti. Row three is championship protagonist Nick Cassidy, his nearest rival, Jake Dennis, actually, of course, just up the road, uh, ahead of Maxi Gunter in the Maserati. Then it's Dan Tictum and Nico Muller, the Neo and the Apt. Cooper, Sergio Sete Camera and Roberto Meri line up P9 and P10 respectively. Then 11th and 12th is Jean Eric Verne and Pascal Verlein. And then Stoffel Van Dorn, whose car we saw being hastily repaired. Okay, this is race control. Garages. Please have cars start lining up behind the safety car in the restart order. In the restart order. Car 2 so. 3, car 9, car 5 8, 2 7, 3 7, 7, 3 3, 5 1, 3 8. Two, five, nine, four, and one. That's the voice of Scott Elkins, who is the, the safety car FIA in race the director. Order, as displayed on the timing monitors, please. So Scott Elkins, they're just giving uh, direction as to which cars should line up where on the grid. Of course, it does give another opportunity here for Pascal Verlein. Just the riding on board here with Sebastian Buemi. This is the incident that, uh, of course, ended his race and indeed wiped out pretty much half of the field as we run on board. With this character, I don't think we've actually seen this particular view. Oh, that is absolutely horrible, isn't it? Watching it on board like that. Yeah, that was a, it's a heavy impact. There was not a yellow flag at that point because Sandbird had just had his accident, and so there was very limited time for any yellow flag, any warning flag to come out for the drivers following, and so certainly very tough. Sylvain Felipe came into this weekend uh, with two drivers that were very, very competitive, and he's now down to one. However, that driver's Nick Cassidy. 
previous winner of the last race and also uh, someone that I think can be definitely looking at podium for this race. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's head down to Saunders before we get this restart underway and find out what's happening on the ground in the pit lane. So back in the pit lane studio with Oliver Askew. Now, there's a couple of things we want to look at, or one thing in particular, in very much slow motion, because we need to get a proper look at this. It's Sam Bird and Jake Dennis, and just how close Jake Dennis comes to his race being over. Let's have a look at this and play it through, but really slow it down straight away. Oliver, take it away. Yeah, so what we can clearly see here, there's a manhole cover that just as that crosswalk passes, and Sam Bird cro went over that, bottomed out, and then uh, essentially lost grip, which then tossed him into the dirty part of the track. Um, Jake Dennis narrowly missed hitting a, a Sam Bird here and, and you know what might have been a drastic um, yeah, situation for his championship hopes. Let's just take another look at that and slow it down even more because uh, we wanted to see where is that point. It was just earlier, isn't it? It's just right at the start of that clip. Yeah. So play that through. Bump. There it is. Just yeah. there. Now that just goes to show about Formula E racing in general, right? The streets that we race on, they are exactly that. They are streets. They're not purpose built for racing. They have all these imperfections and the drivers have to deal with that. And that is a fundamental part of Formula E racing, is it not? Yes. Each corner has its own characteristic and it's very difficult to manage that. So Absolutely. Well, thank you again for the insight. Uh, let's go back to the cars on track. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Saunders and Ollie, for that analysis of the incident. Lap 9 out of 25 we were on before this race was red flagged. Now behind okay, the safety the car, safety has car, left safety the pit car lane, guys. 13 let's go, let's go. cars. Let's get into order, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just hear the voice there of uh, Scott Elkins, the race director, just giving directions to the teams that they need to be filing out in a particular order. And over the course of the next, uh, we've got now 17 laps remaining in this race, including the one that we're on. We'll see what is going to happen. So the, the Taycan leads the field around. Sasha Fenestras okay, everybody, is let's get together. Let's get, get packed sharp up, end. Please. Let's get packed up. Trying to coordinate to everything. Car length of each other so on track here. Start completed, please. Just trying to get the uh, drivers all lined up with one another. And then we will get this uh, restarted. Formula E race for round 13 here in Rome, back underway in a few moments' time. With Sasha Fenestras in a prime position for this one at the sharp end of the field. And you wonder what is going to be running through his mind in particular at this moment. Mitch Evans, double Rome winner here from last year, took Jaguar's first victory back in 2021 as well. So let's see what is going to uh, happen here with these drivers. So we're looking set like we're going to go for the full race distance here, Alan. Yeah, we'll go for the race distance, no question. We already had that safety car, so there's a chance of uh, some additional laps at the end. Uh, not due to the red flag, because it's basically like a full pause on the race. But uh, we will get to the, the 25 laps, and it's going to be 25 frantic laps. Bit of a reset. Sasha Fenestras had just taken the lead. Mitch Evans had got himself back into second. And uh, so I think there's there's quite a lot of different things to play out here now. As uh, we're hearing just in the break, Pascal Verlein is back. He's got to get out of jail free card. He's in 12th position there. And uh, with a sort of resettled LT car. Managers, the timing screens are correct in regards to current lap and laps remaining. Uh, just a bit of information there to the teams. The timing screens are correct with current laps, laps remaining. Uh, that's just a piece of additional info. Yeah, absolutely. So now the focus shifts on the race the beginning. We've lost uh, quite a number of drivers in that one. Sam Bird, Sebastian Bird. Attention all teams, teams, there is a surface flag at uh, turn six just for some of the oil dry that we put down there. Um, it's just a little bit dusty, so just please, please be aware. So, surface flag there, down at uh, turn six. That's what you want to hear as a team principal. One of your cars is out, but there's a dusty oil flag at the fastest part of the circuit <laughs> just before they go racing again. Yeah, just to give you another thing to have to worry about in this race. Uh, Eddie Mortara also out of this one. Lucas Degrassi, Robin Frines, etc. And we know, of course, Andre Lossera was out following an incident earlier on in the race, which actually brought out the safety car in the opening stages. So running the ball we are here then with our race leader, Sasha Fenestras. Getting ready to bring the field across the timing line. Sam Bird, the man who started that chain reaction full of incidents. 
listening in the garage wondering what might have been a bit of a missed opportunity perhaps but we are then ready to get racing action to resume then lap 9 out of 25 round 13 of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship is about to resume it's Sasha Fenestrand in the Nissan followed by Mitch Evans Followed by Rene Ras, Jake Dennis, Nick Cassidy, Max Gunter, Dan Tickton, Nico Muller, Sergio Setticamera, Roberto Meri, John Eric Verne, Pascal Verlein, Stoffel Van Dorn, and then Norman Netto completing the field. It'll be a standing start here for this one as we wait for the drivers to come round to their grid position. So it will be a case of the five red lights coming on and heading down and towards that first corner for a second time of asking. Way on to the starting grid, very unique starting grid. It actually goes under the tunnel here, as you can see, which is a bit of a, a flyover just above. And Sasha Penestras, so high up on the grid, he probably has got a nosebleed from there. Rennie Rast was very aggressive at the first start. He's on the clean side of the grid. Mitch Evans is now a little bit more vulnerable in second on the grid on the dirty side. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see what is going to happen then as we look at Stoffel van Dorn just getting his uh, DS Penske into position. 16 laps of racing action ready to go for the restart. And what can this man, Jake Dennis, do from fourth place on the grid? Well, then, it is all eyes ready to go. Green flag is waved at the back. Flashing amber lights above on the lighting gantry, but no problems as we get ready to go racing then. It's going to be time for the five red lights to come on. Fenestras on the left, Evans on the right, lights out, and we're racing. Not a bad start from Evans, not bad also from Jake Dennis off the dirty side of the grid. Rennie Rast tries to defend as they come down towards the first corner. Rast goes for the outside line. He's side by side with Evans on the middle of the corner as well. Cassidy goes side by side with Gunther, but it is Fenestras that leads the way through the first corner. But Rast moving down the order at the expense of Jake Dennis. He made an absolutely brilliant start. Now up into third place and chasing the tail of Mitch Evans. Yeah, Jake Dennis really did attack. There is a much more gentle and circumspect up into turn seven. But Jake Dennis is there on the outside. That's a difficult place to be. You don't want to be there, Jake. Oh, Maxi Gunther having a look on the inside there of Nick Cassidy as they came through into turn seven. He's just able to get that move done in the Maserati. So Cassidy now relegated down a position. Dan Tickton keeping a watching brief on proceedings, but it is Sasha Fenestras then who leads the field, followed by uh, Mitch Evans, who's still in front of Jake Dennis. That great start of the race for Jake Dennis as he tries to get his far up the order as he can whilst the field is bunched up here on this opening lap. Yeah, we've got to remember Jake Dennis started the original race in seventh place. He's on the podium right now and he's right behind one of his main title contenders. And so very, very strong uh, attack there from Jake Dennis. Clever way that he took advantage of Rennie Rast as a couple of them, three, go through the attack board straight away. Yeah, that's the two DS Penske's of Jono Verne and Stoffel van Dorn as well as Norman Nato in the Nissan. So four minutes of attack mode for both of the DS Penske's. Six minutes left there for uh, Norman Nato. He's still got two minutes remaining. Just looking at some of the drivers who don't have anything remaining, that's including Nico Muller um, as well. And you can see there that Crucially, Jake Dennis has got all of his attack mode remaining there in third place. Nick Cassidy is on the attack as well. Gunter up ahead of him. He just muscled his way through, but Cassidy's looked very, very good in the final sector, and it's quite clear he wants that position back. Yeah, so let's see what's going to happen here. We're going to have a move being made possibly here with Jake Dennis side by side with Mitch Evans down as well as Maxi Gunter goes to the inside line there. Or Rene Rast for fourth place. Was he able to make the move stick? Don't think he was. They're still side by side as they come through the fastest part of the track through turn five, down into towards turn six, and Cassidy manages to lead him in all of that chaos. Yeah, Gunter was out there on the wrong side of the circuit, the dirty side he had to lift off and that allowed Cassidy to come through. So Cassidy's made his way back up now, defending very vigorously. Oh, Ren Renny Rass touches the back of Jake Dennis, just a little bit of a kiss, Gunter goes for it again, backs out. Yeah, he's going to come under attack here, possibly from Dan Tickton there as well. Tickton thinks better of it, decides that discretion is the better part of Valor for now. You see the drivers who've activated the tech mode on the left-hand side of your screen, that includes John Eric Vernon, it includes Stoffel Van Dorn and Norman Nato. Life points standings on the bottom right of your screen it would be Jake Dennis if the checker flag fell now that would take a six point swing into round 14 here tomorrow let's see whether he's going to be able to keep that gap or whether he might even be able to extend that gap as he sits in third place of course with the full eight minutes of attack mode ready at his disposal now coming round the obelisk there here's Evans his radio he's second that was on the wrong strategy he's just gone longer now he might start coasting earlier 
Benistraz was in the wrong strategy. He may start coasting earlier. Basically, he was on base in a little bit too much. Flat out mode. And as you can see, he's got 3% less. As does Rennie Rast than the people behind him. Rast has now got to be careful because Cassidy behind him has got more energy and he will look to overtake as soon as he can. Yeah, this is going to be crucially important. Mainly sound 3% doesn't sound like a lot, but it's the equivalent of uh, about a lap and a half or so. You can see there as the striking distance graphic sits on your screen on the right-hand side. You can see there that Cassidy in fifth place, Jake Dennis up the road in third place, so looking pretty marginal at the moment. Rass there on the defence against Nick Cassidy. And every time he defends, then he's using more energy as well because he's not taking the optimum line through the corner. He's going a bit slower in and then having to use energy to accelerate out. Yeah, Cassidy here needs to try and pick up the pace and get himself ahead of Rene Rass as soon as he possibly can. Mitch Evans there looking like he's trying to go on the attack as Fenestras goes slightly defensive in towards seven. Oh, oh, it's all cuts leadering up, yeah, that is, that's uh, unfortunately one of the App Coopers. That, of course, is the only remaining App Cooper of Nico Muller, who went into the back, I think, of maybe Dan Tickton in towards that seventh, uh, seventh corner. I think jean Eric Verne was involved in some strife there too. Yeah, it's all closing up at the back, but another problem for Pascal Verlein. He's had a roller coaster day. He's under investigation for over-speeding under the red flag. Oh, that is a disaster there for Pascal Verlein. There's the damage for Dan Tictum on board the number 33. So the Britain's race with damage on the front of his uh, car. And look at Cassidy up the inside of Rene Rast in towards 14. Does he make the move stick? Yes, he does. So now manages to get himself ahead of the Neon McLaren. Next target is going to be Jake Dennis into attack mode. Goes Maxi Gunter from fifth place. Yeah, he gets out in front of the Neo as well. Quite neat and tidy there from Gunter. He's dropped himself down into seventh, so he's now behind Jean-Éric Verne. But the person on the charge definitely is Nick Cassidy. And I would say by the performance over the weekend, then he has got the speed to have a look at Jake Dennis. And they are one and two in the championship. Rast into the pits. Rennie Rast is into the pits. Yeah, problem there for Rennie Rast then, quite clearly. Uh, was dropping down the order already after being under attack there from Nick Cassidy. And clearly something wrong with the Neil McLaren. It has not been a brilliant day for them. Jake Hughes not taking to the start of the original race due to a crash in qualifying. We won't see him out again until tomorrow. And a DNF seemingly here for Rast as well. Fenestras is really struggling on energy, he's 3 to 4% less, and the problem is getting bigger for him. Yes, he's leading, but he's holding a hole in the air for Evans and Co. behind, just to conserve energy, just to sit in that slipstream. And therefore, now he's having to defend. The more he defends, the harder it is. Look at Jake Dennis on the outside. Yeah, he's going to make the move stick down in towards the right-hander. The left-hander knows, not quite able to. He's going to leave him possibly under attack here from Nick Cassidy as well, who seizes an opportunity. Vernon Muller, uh, Gunter going side-by-side side in the background there as well. Gunter just able to stay ahead in the Maserati, and he in turn is trying to nip at the heels of Cassidy there as well. Their nose-to-tail running as they come through this middle sector, and it's Fezestraz who's backing the pack up. There's an absolute train of cars behind him here at this stage. And it is anybody's guess as to how this is going to work out through turn 12, through turn 13. Is anybody going to go for attack mode on lap 13? Let's find out. As they come down towards that point now, but Fenestraz is going to have to really do something here. But being out in front and going at the pace he's going, he's just not going to be able to make it to the end. He's just using too much energy to be able to do it. But Nick Cassidy, he's looking to try to take advantage. Every time Dennis goes to the outside into turn seven of Evans, then Cassidy is just in an optimum position to pick up the place. Roberto Mary and, crucially, Pascal Verlein go for attack mode. Two minutes left for both of those drivers. Verlein uh, sitting down in 12th at the moment. He's going to try and pick up as many points as he possibly can here. So there's only two drivers that haven't used any attack mode. One of them is Jake Dennis in third, Nick Cassidy in fourth. So those two title protagonists could possibly put a bit of pressure here onto the back of Mitch Evans, who has activated one of his attack modes so far in this race. Through the left hand, we go across the start-finish line and down in towards the first series of corners. There's Cassidy trying to make a move here on Jake Dennis, but here comes Max Gunter on the inside as well. Side-by-side -side action, they go. Gunter on the inside, still trying to hold it the long way around the outside. Two by two through here is a very brave move, given how bumpy the circuit is. Max Gunter decides that discretion is a better part of Bala, backs out for the time being. He does love a late dive into that turn four, does Max Gunter. And they're looking, they're just all now trying to hold their position more than necessarily attack and look to try and take advantage if somebody gets pushed out of position. 
lots of argy bargy going on further back as well as the drivers uh, try to make some moves. You can see the graphic on the left hand side of the screen, that's where they're accelerating, and then of course, regening energy as well. So they're lifting off, lifting and coasting, trying to get as much energy back into the uh, powertrain as they possibly can to give them as much energy as they have for the remainder of this race. Sasha Fenestra, as it is, still leading the way, but he's got less energy remaining than Evans and Dennis behind him at the moment. He's got a lot less energy, and I think if uh, Cassidy gets past Dennis, you'll see Evans have an attack on Fenestra. He doesn't want to necessarily be in a position where he's got the envisioned driver right behind him. So I think he knows that he's got a bit of performance advantage over Dennis, but I don't think he does over Cassidy. Cassidy's trying to pull the pin here, isn't he? He's really beginning to put the pressure onto Dennis. Dennis having to take slightly defensive line in, into these uh, right and left handers, into these 90 degree corners. And now it's a case of Dennis if he's going to be able to defend from the Kiwi. And this is going to be crucial in the championship for where they're going to finish. Of course, they both still have the maximum amount of attack mode available side by oh, side. We go Dennis here, and it's a challenge for second place with Dennis getting ahead of Mitch Evans and Copy through that. he goes on the Kiwi and the Jaguar and, and up into the second place putting a buffer. 16. That all puts, also puts Cassidy into play as well because Cassidy's now round the outside of Evans. Is he going to be able to pull it off? I don't think so. I think he's too far to be able to do it round there, but it means that Cassidy is right there with Evans. And what's Dennis going to do? Well, this is going to be really important here. These drivers, Cassidy and Dennis, as we know, have still got the full use of attack mode available. Coming down over the bumps we go into turn number seven. Trying to go for the outside line there is Cassidy having a half look. Uh, he might leave him under oh. attack here quite possibly. And look at this, Dennis on the inside of Fenestrats going for the race lead in towards the left-hander. Lap 15 and a 25 are on. We've got a new race leader. It is Jake Dennis in the Avalanche Andretti. Now, what is it, what are his tactics going to be here in this race? Well, he needs to try to get away a little bit, and I think he probably can because Fenestrats needs to conserve energy right now. All right, Houston, yeah? Houston. I think that was the comment there. That's obviously a code because they don't want everybody to know, especially not us on the television. <laughs> but Dennis has still got to take his attack mode. So therefore, I think he's going to probably go one more lap and then try to bring it in. Yeah, this is crucial here as to when you deploy the extra power that you have available. 300 kilowatts they start the race with. When you go into attack mode, it gives you 50 more kilowatts. 350 is what they'll have when they go into that attack mode area. Cassidy's the one with the most energy at this moment in time, then Evans and Dennis. Yeah, so those three drivers really close to one another in terms of the amount of energy remaining. The uh, lowest on the track is actually Roberto Merry down in 12th place, and also, crucially, Sasha Fenestras in the Nissan in 13th place. Might leave him under threat here from Mitch Evans, and let's see whether Evans is going to try and retaliate on the Nissan driver. They have to get past the Nissan. Here's Fenestras' radio. Yeah, I know, but uh, it's on purpose, or what? Do I follow the guy, or what? Just tell me, Jojo, what to do, man. I need to overconsume if I want to follow. Overconsume means use too much energy. Uh, he's got to basically drop in behind. He cannot survive at this pace. He needs to get the information from his team, drop behind, and then use them as slipstream. That's exactly what he's done now. He's let Evans go. Evans goes through then into second place. Now he's going to have the hole punched in the air in front of him instead of being punched in front of him. So let's see how this works out. Jake Dennis, meanwhile, now 1.6 seconds to the good of uh, Mitch Evans, who is in second position. So this is going to be really important here for Jake Dennis as well because he's now built out enough of a buffer. If he goes into attack mode here on this lap, he could potentially keep the lead. He's just going to run wide through at turn 15, and that's where you activate the attack mode. Let's see what is going to happen here for Dennis as he comes through. Two seconds now, the advantage builds over Mitch Evans, and he's going to go into attack mode then. So the race leader into that area of the track, activates his attack mode. Now he's going to go for the first of two minutes, so two minutes and then for him. And uh, also Sergio Sese camera going in as well, uh, with uh, still the lead of the race for Jake Dennis. Cassidy needs to get past Fenestra's ASAP because he's got the energy to be able to do it, but also you can see the two ahead just eking away right now. Yeah, this is crucial here for Nick Cassidy, really needs to begin to pile the pressure on to Sasha Fenestraz and get past him before too long. He doesn't want to let the top two break away into the distance. You can see the attack modes remaining then once the current ones have uh, run down. It'll be six minutes apiece for the top three, but Cassidy still has that full application of attack mode remaining is he going to try and go for a dive down the inside into the left hander of turn four he goes through crucial there for Nick Casting needed to do that as soon as he possibly can now his next target is Mitch Evans with the full deployment of attack mode at his disposal 
What do you want me to do, man? Am I going with the uh, things or not? Mode toggle, mode toggle. Mode toggle, your guess is as good as mine, but what I can tell you is Jake Dennis has just done the fastest first sector of the race so far. So I would suggest Mode toggle is get on there, boy, and get moving. Yeah, well, 44 seconds now remaining of this current deployment here for Jake Dennis, so he'll have six uh, left and ready to go. You can see lap 17 of the 25, this race is absolutely flying by, and it is anybody's guess as to who is going to claim the chequered flag. It was Mitch Evans who started originally from pole position, Team Radio. Just need to manage this gap to Mitch at the moment. Mitch on threshold, risky one. So there, just instruction for him to manage that gap to Mitch. Both of them have got some uh, attack mode left at their disposal. Not going for it this time around. Makes sense uh, for them to continue in the same vein as they started. We ride on board here with Jake Dennis, who's soaking up the pressure from Mitch Evans and the Jaguar TCS racing machine like an absolute sponge at the moment it's going to get really frenetic as we come in towards the closing stages of this one here we saw a very fast first sector and then actually it's been the other way around cassidy and also evans caught up but i tell you what evans is looking really really good here you see on the left hand side the attack mode time remaining dennis six minutes evans six cassidy still got eight minutes to go he hasn't been through that yet Nick Cassidy, the winner from Portland last time out. Can he make it two wins from two races? in a great opportunity to do so. Fenestras coming under pressure here from Max Gunter down in towards the left-hander of turn number four. No move being made there for the Maserati at the moment. Just behind them, of course, is John Eric Byrne in the DS Penske and Muller in the At Cupra as well. On board we go through six on the rise, up in towards seven. We know that he's not afraid of a late dive. Is Gunter goes defensive then, does Fenestras, but Gunter ahead already before the breaking zone. And up through into four. Just got to give you a little bit of a shout out for some of the runners and riders that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Nico Muller is in seventh, Sergio Setti Cameron the Neo in ninth, and and Verline is still in tenth. He hasn't really moved up very much. Yeah, Sergio Setti Cameron just uh, moving uh, up the order. There is Nico Muller. You can see in the App Cooper having an absolutely uh, fantastic run. It's been a really challenging 2020. Uh, three season for the Apps Cooper team so far with that uh, Mahindra power unit and uh, well Nico Miller will be hoping to uh, try and make some uh, ground because he's only had two points on the board this year as into the attack mode then goes Jake Dennis and he drops behind Mitch Evans so six minutes now is what he's deployed on lap 18 of the 25 and Cassidy of course crucially has gone in for the first time here as well as you can see so two minutes at the, the disposal here for Nick Cassidy in the opening stages yeah six minutes for Dennis there is he now he'll sit in behind uh, he'll sit in behind Evans as Evans has just done the fastest lap of the race crucial not just because of the bragging rights but because of the point that comes with it Jaguar TCS Racing telling Mitch Evans to push as hard as he can at the moment. He's responded with that with the fastest lap, as Alan said, of the race so far. So, a bit of a stalemate here between Dennis and Cassidy. Both of those drivers have deployed attack mode. Dennis, though, going for the full six minutes, which is what he had remaining here in this race. Is that going to leave him vulnerable in the closing stages? Lap 19 out of 25, we sit on here for round 13 down in towards the left-hander of turn seven we go heartbreaking zones there we've seen a few drivers getting it wrong but no problem so far team radio we'll have gap to attack to cassidy if he goes crazy let him go if not we attack so information there for uh, for him to say that uh, if he goes crazy then we can attack if not then we'll go so let's see what is going to work out here for mitch evans as we look at the kiwi Three times a winner at this Rome circuit. He needs to try and build a gap out to Jake Dennis as much as he possibly can, but that's a hard task given the fact that Dennis has got 50 kilowatts more power available. So there you see on the right-hand side the attack zone graphic, which they don't take except uh, Gunter on this lap. That graphic showed you the fact that if Evans did take attack mode, he would lose too much time and slip in behind Jake Dennis. One of the reasons they didn't actually do it. He's looking now to try to build the gap and do what Dennis did before, take the attack mode and still uh, then come out in the lead. Yeah, that is the main aim, name of the game to try and uh, lose as few positions as you possibly can when you're going into that attack mode. Another fastest lap though of the race for the leader, Mitch Evans. Yeah, and I know that Cassidy's just been into attack mode, but actually he's three seconds behind now. Evans and Dennis are checking out. They are the ones that are delivering the lap time. Six, seven tenths 
faster than Cassidy on the last lap. Yeah, this is going to be really interesting to see what happens here for Nick Cassidy. Is he going to be in the prime seats? Meanwhile, Fenestra is still coming under uh, yet more pressure here in the form of Sergio Sete Camera. We know that Fenestra has been struggling with energy over the remainder of this race. Defensive line there for Mitch Evans as Dennis tries to attack down into seven. Yeah, but Dennis has got 3% less energy than Mitch Evans, so Evans is actually in a good position right now because it doesn't come for free. You don't get speed just for free, and by using that, also the attack mode, because then he's using more power anyway, it goes to 350 kilowatts, then naturally it does drop down your energy. Yeah, what he needs here is Evans to go into the attack mode so he can get himself ahead and, and try and make as much ground as he possibly can, but with that fewer energy remaining, could be set to could be said to be pretty crucial here. I wonder if Evans is going to go into the attack mode here on this lap. He's got more energy remaining. He's got one more attack mode disposal left at his helm as well. Coming in towards turn 15, he goes through Team Radio as well. 3% up on Dennis. We definitely attack this lap. So Team Radio there saying that he's got more energy than Dennis and he's going to use this opportunity to attack. He's gone through into there. And as you can see there, Michael Andretti looking at it. You know, he knows a little bit of the extra numbers behind it. Whichever way for Jake Dennis, he's in a good position because it looks like the top three have definitely e extended their gap. Gunter in fourth is now four seconds behind Dennis. I just understand, yeah, I was wondering on the graphic why Evans, uh, the attack mode, didn't come through, but he missed the activation point, he missed one of the, uh, loops. the so loops. there's three loops and you have to run the car over all three to be able to then use it, and so therefore he'll have to do that again. Well, that is absolute worst case scenario here for Mitch Evans, could be set to cost him race victory. Let's have another look at it, it was really tight uh, going into that corner, trying to cut the, oh yeah, just half a wheel almost on the very, inside it's very very tight it looked like he kind of got it because the, the sensors placed on it it's not actually the whole car it's where the sensor is placed on the car and that activates again sensors on the circuit well meatloaf one saying two out of three ain't bad we still have the gap to cassidy and have the energy advantage to then to catch him back cassidy another attack to go let's go motivation there for him but it could be set to be the threat here possibly even from nick cassidy here as well He's really putting the pressure onto the back of uh, Jake Dennis, and that's what he needs to do because Dennis has got more power available. Yeah, but what Dennis wants to do is to back up Evans so that when he does take this attack mode, Evans, I mean, then he is behind Cassidy. Yeah, he wants to try and put a buffer between himself then, doesn't he? Let's see whether uh, Evans is going to go I, into the he's attack going. He's going to go for it. Let's make hope she doesn't make the same mistake twice. Goes through into there. Did he manage to get all three of them? Yes, he does this time, as does Nick Cassidy. So six minutes of remaining extra power available for Evans and Nick Cassidy then in the closing stage of this race three and a half laps now to go it's Jake Dennis in front 30 seconds left of his attack mode deployment available and Evans now sitting himself ahead of Cassidy because both of those drivers went into the attack mode at the same time is that the right call there from Cassidy or do you think he should have carried on another lap and put that buffer no they have to do it because there is only three laps to go plus the added laps and they have to finish all of their attack mode by the time they get to the end of the race and so therefore you have to ensure that that you get it done and so right now um, it's all about what is going to be the added laps is it going to be one two or three probably two or three so here we see then Mitch Evans right on the heels of Jake Dennis his attack mode now is over though it was extra extra 50 kilowatts of power come to an end and now he's gonna possibly be under attack 4.7 Sean again same year so Team Radio there as Mitch Evans goes through into the race lead. Frustration then for Dennis as he loses out to Mitch Evans in the Jaguar TCS racing car. The question is, is he going to lose out to Cassidy as well? Because he is out of it. Cassidy's got nearly five minutes. That's nearly three laps of attack mode, 350 kilowatts, where now Dennis is kind of a little bit like a sitting duck at 300 kilowatts. Well, this is going to be absolutely crucial there. The high-speed game of chess, as it always proves to be, fewer energy, amount of energy remaining there for Jake Dennis to the tune of about 3% compared to Mitch Evans with three I'm laps now remaining. Duck, mate. And frustration starts to creep in here for Jake Dennis as well. Quite clearly, he is really feeling the pressure as he comes under pressure here from Nick Cassidy. Cassidy to the inside. Does he go through in the second? Yes, he does. So now the ambition is up through with a clear track in front of him. Silvan Felipe applauds the team principal of that outfit. And now his next target is going to be Mitch Evans at the sharp end of the field. They've both got very similar amounts of uh, extra power remaining with the attack mode.
two added laps to go, so it'll be a total of a 27 lap race. So Jay Dennis really unhappy with his race engineer, as we understand it, and this is going to be crucial for the championship here as well. It will mean that if the checkered flag falls now, that Cassidy will take the swing back in the title by two points. Yeah, but the thing is, now Dennis is also vulnerable to Gunther. Gunther still got more energy as well, and so he's going to potentially finish fourth and not on the podium, as he would hope. Now, they're both on the same, I would say, uh, power mode, but ultimately, uh, Gunther's got that little bit more energy, and there he goes. He's not afraid of making a move here, is Maxi Gunther up the rise into turn seven we go, and the Maserati is now through. Could it be a home podium for the Italian outfit here in Rome? Looking that way for the time being, Roger Griffiths watches on, and he'll have his head in his hand and wonders what might have been. Uh, Gunther, energy to like P6. Oh, oh Gunther's wide, Gunther into the wall on the outside through the middle sector. That might be an opportunity here for Jake Dennis to try and retaliate. Can the British rider find his way back through onto the podium? I, I don't think it's retaliation because of that. I think it's whether there's damage to Gunther. At the end of the day, he skipped it side to side, but has it caused any damage? And you can hear how early now Jake Dennis is having to lift off. So then on board we ride here with Jake Dennis's race really falling apart here in these closing stages. Gunther's car seems like it's all okay. Close behind, there's a good battle going on as well between Vern and Muller here as well. This is in the battle for fifth place and they're catching Dennis. Vern and Muller are catching Jake Dennis. How much energy they've got remaining? We can't see that at the particular moment. You can see their uh, added laps on your screen on the top left corner. So it will be a 27 lap race here as Alan said a few moments ago. But Nico Muller having at Cooper's best race of the season. He's only had two points so far in uh, 2023 as Nico Muller. And this is his best opportunity to try and increase that. OK, we stay calm, we stay calm. It's OK. Focus, full focus. Yeah, that's basically engineer to good to who hit the wall and uh, just trying to get him back into the kick, take a breath, reset, go again. You can see exactly what this means here with Dennis's race falling apart in the closing stages for the championship standings. It will give a good, healthy advantage to Nick Cassidy, since second in the standings by just uh, one point at the moment, and it could be set to take over the lead and with a, a little bit more of a buffer than he might have been expecting. Nico Muller has got more energy than Vern and Dennis. Nico Muller is in actually a really good position here. This could be by far their best result. This is absolutely fantastic for Nico Muller and the App Cooper team. They've not had a lot to smile about in uh, 2023 as it stands. And he's now right on the back as these three drivers run nose to tail with one another. And Dennis, is he defenceless in his position at the moment? P4 he sits. Nico Muller looking there to try and make a move on the back of jean eric Verne, the double Formula E champion. No room at the end for now. But as they come through into the middle sector, maybe an opportunity will present itself here for him. Dennis has 0.14 kilowatt hours per lap, lower target than him. 0.14 hours lower target, that's jean eric Verne ahead of him. As now it is uh, Dennis that is the cork in the bottle. If one gets past, both will get past. The question is, which one of these three is going to finish up in fourth place? No tell they run then as they come through at the end of what would have been the normal race finish. But two added laps here that have been awarded to the drivers as they come through. It is nose to tail running here as they head down in towards the heavy braking zone of the left-hander. Absolutely superb race here for Nico Muller, not bad also for uh, jean eric Verne as well, that Diaz Penske uh, machine going pretty well in fifth place for now. Dennis, well, I wonder what uh, might have been, you can see there with uh, Mitch Evans, still leading the way quite comfortably at the moment over Nick Cassidy. This is going to have to be robust defensiveness from uh, from Jake Dennis. If yellow he's flag, going to yellow, yellow flag. flags out. Let's okay, see what's happening. That's the yellow at turn, turn seven. seven is for debris. The yellow at turn uh, seven is for debris. It looks like Stoffel Van Dorn uh, from wing is missing on the other of the DS Penske. So clearly he has had a coming together with the wall. Van Dorn down in 11. So outside of the points paying positions for now, but not the way he will have wanted to have finished his race. And the yellow flag might just be a, a saving grace for a brief moment here. Yeah, Pascal Verlein as well, just noting him, he's now up to seventh place. So therefore, Verlein, from a championship point of view, still kind of keeps himself hanging on. Well, we understand that it was actually uh, Van Dorn and Verlein that uh, came together uh, during that one. 
We didn't see exactly what happened, but either way, the debris that's uh, stricken over the circuit has uh, brought the yellow flag out, and so it continues. But look here at Nico Muller all over the back of jean eric Verne like a bad rash as he tries to find his way past. More defensive driving here from uh, Jake Dennis as they come through into the final sector. But is it all going to be in vain? The two added laps come into effect now. So it goes from a 25 to a 27 lap race duration, and we ride on board. And it seems like it's a matter of when and not if he is going to have a bite. Yeah, but Dennis is now sort of creeping himself back into it. It's only 1% difference to the people bringing back, so he's done a very good job of creating enough of a, I would say, wide car not to allow him to be mugged by the two, the two behind, two managers, but he's still going to have to defend a lot. Yeah, he really is. That was due to lifting coast and getting a bit of regen breaking in that Avalanche end race. So he's done a really good job of just backing the pack up. It's now damage limitation time here for Jake Dennis. Can he salvage fourth place in this one? The podium is going to be out of the question, but as he still comes under ever-increasing pressure from John Eric Verne and Nico Muller. No to tell, this is where you see exactly what these drivers are made of, but yellow flag crucially into one of the most important overtaking spots on the track at Turn 7. That, of course, is due to the debris of Stoffel van Dorn's front wing. Yeah, it's going to be a very robust overtake uh, from uh, John Eric Verne if he's going to do it, but he's also got to be careful because if he doesn't quite get it done, Nico Muller's definitely there to pick up the pieces. Well, this is going to be absolutely thrilling. What an end to the race we have got. Mitch Evans has got 1.6 seconds at the front, meanwhile, over Nick Casti having a half look there is uh, Jean Eric Verne, but no room for him down in towards turn 12. It certainly wouldn't be a place to go uh, two by two through that series of corners. Team Radio. Same target as the leaders now, same target as leaders. That'd be a blessed yeah. relief there for Dennis. <laughs> yeah, but I think the 14 second gap is the thing that's frustrating him more than necessarily, but he, at least he knows that he can now play a little bit more aggressively with the guys behind. Still going defensive as John Eric Verne tries to attract, tries to invent something in towards these 93 left. This could be a, an opportunity for him, maybe trying to compromise the British driver's traction coming through this series of corners and maybe set one up the inside. Look at how tight he's making that corner, but that's going to cost him time on the exit of the corner out of that final turn. Definitely is. Final lap. So final lap, then we are then with uh, Mitch Evans leading the way from Nick Casti. This has been a great drive also uh, from Max Gunther, who sits in uh, third place. And uh, in terms of Kiwi drivers, they've finished 1-2 twice this season so far, back in Sao Paulo and also in Monaco as well. So let's see whether they can make it a Kiwi 1-2 here this afternoon with less than one lap now remaining. And Jake Dennis tries as hard as he can to hold on for fourth place against John Eric Byrne as they come through the left of turn six. Is the yellow flag still going to be that corner? No, it's gone away now. Down the outside goes John Eric Byrne on Jake Dennis. Dennis defends the inside line. Nico Muller there ready to try and pick up the pieces if he can. Byrne really, really getting his elbows out here, but no room for him to make his way through into fourth for now. What an absolutely superb drive, meanwhile, at the helm of the race. This has been for uh, Mitch Evans. He has controlled this one absolutely brilliantly, whilst others faltered behind him. Nick Cassidy sitting in third place. Here comes John Eric Burns, still trying to attack on the back of Jake Dennis, but no way for him to come through. Meanwhile, it's just a couple of corners remaining here for the Kiwi. Mitch Evans, what a drive it has been. It was pole position here this morning, and he comes through the final series of corners to make it his third win in a row. In row, across the line comes Mitch Evans to win for Jaguar TCS Racing for round 13 of the ABB FIA Formula E Championship. It's a Kiwi 1-2, and in the battle for fifth place as well, it's side by side here between Vern and between Nico Muller. Vern just about manages to hold it against the Abt Cupra into the final corner. Dennis gets over the line in fourth place, just ahead of Jean-Éric Byrne and Nico Muller. What an absolutely superb end to that race. Pascal Verlein takes seventh as well. Come on, who's the king of road? Kevin! Yes! And that's with Pascal's lap. Perfect event. Come on, maximum points! Well, he is the absolute king of Rome. Undisputed there uh, for Mitch Evans. Nick Cassidy as well doing a great job. Mitch, it's Alan here. Congratulations. Fantastic third victory in a trot and fourth overall here in Rome in what was a frenetic race. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Uh, yeah, just incredible. My fourth one here is uh, at a really crucial time of the, uh, of the season. Uh, you know, Nick pushed me hard. Uh, it was really a game of sort of two halves in this race, so I kept that cool. 
and uh, the team and I executed a, a perfect race. So I'm just thank, big thanks to the team for guiding me through. And uh, we're rolling to tomorrow. Well done. Get ready for tomorrow. Well, I suppose the, the sweet victory feeling is going to be somewhat short-lived here for uh, Mitch Evans. As you say, round 14 to come here tomorrow in the sweltering sunshine of Rome. But what a drive for Mitch Evans here for Jaguar. Now, we mentioned a little bit earlier on that Pascal Verlein and uh, his overspeeding under the red flag was under investigation. He's going to be investigated actually after the race. He finished seventh in that one, getting some crucial points on the board, but that could be up for debate now. Yeah, well, it's uh, not a performance point, it's a safety point because it was under red flag, so it's not as if he gained any particular position. And ultimately, he then had to start at the back anyway because of uh, the damage to his car. And so I would think that uh, it's unlikely to change the positions of the race, but it's also not uh, a surprise if he gets penalty points and a fine. Yeah, absolute delight for Mitch Evans then. And you can see the championship standings, and this is what it means, though, for Nick Cassidy. Despite Mitch Evans' win, he moves closer in terms of points. Now 20 off the top, but it is Nick Cassidy who is uh, five to the good of Jake Dennis. Dennis had a one-point advantage coming into round 13. Let's have a look at a replay here for Jake Dennis. This was the frenetic final few corners. You can see just how defensive he was going. Muller trying to go for the outside line oh, into beautiful. 15. Absolutely beautiful by Nico Muller. Just couldn't quite hang it on. But what that did is, is, again, Dennis was super defensive there, was it meant that Fern was focusing on Muller and not focusing on Dennis. And Dennis was strategically very clever, the way that he held everything back up through turn six on the final lap to give himself enough energy to defend on that final lap. Oh, yeah. car with a wheel off. Yeah, that's the App Cooper of Nico Muller on the uh, final lap, on the cooldown lap, if, if that's anything. I think so it stopped. Yeah, that stops, doesn't it? So Nico Muller, I uh, wonder exactly what's happened there to the Swiss driver. Manages to get the car reset, control alt delete, and back into the pit lane now as the celebrations are soon to begin. Mitch Evans then takes the victory. What an absolutely astonishing drive for him. Fastest lap in that race as well. Paul win fastest lap. Can't do much better than that. Oh, exactly. What Apart a... from leading all of the laps, but <laughs> ultimately, we'll wait and see for tomorrow. When's that ever happened in Formula E? What a great drive. What a great drive from uh, Nick Cassidy as well. I thought he was in trouble this morning when we looked at him in free practice. He's down in 15th at the end of uh, that session. 25% of you have voted him as the driver of the race. That's Mitch Evans as well for round 13 of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. And, of course... Uh, a double Kiwi podium as well. Mitch Evans and Nick Cassidy on the top two steps for the third time now this season. Great drive and uh, great for Envision Racing. And who knows, we might be seeing these two Kiwis in the same colours for season 10 well, of Formula E. You never know, but there's three races still to go and a scrap that will start again tomorrow morning. Uh, as, uh, you know, they realise now it's quite clear that uh, both of them are in the fight. Jake Dennis is definitely in the fight. There'll be a little bit of disappointment, I think, from Dennis's point of view. He felt that he didn't necessarily get the strategy right. A little bit erroneous on the lap counts and then for overconsumption on energy. But uh, he'll be back tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, now the journey to the podium begins for our top three drivers here in Rome. As they take a breath, we look forward to seeing what is going to happen for the remainder of this weekend. Great drive also from Max Gunter in the Maserati. Looks a little bit raggedy, let's be honest, in the opening stages of that restart, didn't he? And I thought he was just pushing the envelope a little bit too hard on a couple of occasions, but recovered to third place, which is actually Maserati's uh, first podium uh, here in Rome as well. Yeah, uh, it definitely uh, was. He was putting it down the inside and it was very committed and it required a lot of compliance by the other people around him. Um, but certainly he got the job done, got himself through into a podium. And it was still a little bit away from the front two without question. But it was a strong, strong run there. But uh, I think, you know, we saw Evans 25%.
I have to put Nico Muller up there as well because to drag the At Cupra up into a position as he did in such a difficult frenetic race after Portland where he went off and had an almighty shunt I think it's been stunning for him and also for the team. Yeah, great for Nico Muller. That car was uh, quite hastily repaired, actually, with uh, the chassis actually arriving here this weekend. Mitch Let's Evans. head down to Huge Mitch Evans. Huge congratulations. What a drive, mate. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was almost two races that we had. Um, after the restart, I... Um, I mean, first of all, it was, it was good to see everyone was fine after that shunt. It was, it was pretty big, and obviously Sam had a pretty scary moment, so um, good to see everyone's fine. Um, then after that, I was a little bit down on energy compared to Nick and, and Jake, so I had to try and equalize that. The, the energy targets dropped a lot after the safety car, so it um, became a lot more of an energy race than we were expecting. But um, yeah, I could manage it well. Um, yeah, the team also guided me through, um, like like uh, always, uh, you know, as, as good as possible, and then leave the, leave the rest for me. Um, one little scare with missing the attack, I missed it last loop. I was going there, going through there super slow and I still missed it, so um, need to practice that tomorrow. But yeah, just a huge result, obviously maximum points today, so um, this is what I needed. Um, only a small dent into, into the next lead, but it's better than uh, being nothing. Firmly retain your crown as the king of Rome and also now being the first driver to win here from pole position. That's true, that's true. Um, we're hoping to break that curse, so um, yeah, four wins here, amazing. Um, not really sure what it is about the place, but uh, I love the track. But we've also got another day tomorrow. I think people will make another big step. Um, Nick was quick in the race as well. So, um, yeah, it's not all, not all uh, you know, it's, it's there for the taking for tomorrow, but we just have to do the right steps. And, and uh, hopefully we've got, you know, a good balance like we had today. Thanks very much. Cool. Thanks. Great job from Mitch Evans, making history, becoming the first driver ever here in Rome to take a pole position and the victory. The previous best place to start the grid was ninth place. Well, Mitch Evans has absolutely dispelled those rumours. You can see here in the first running before the red flag uh, came out that uh, he was leading the way. You can see that it didn't quite go his way at points as well when he missed the attack mode loop and had to go around again. And I wonder whether that might be the time for his race coming undone, but Evans dispelling the myth and taking top honours here this afternoon. Nick Cassidy, a tremendous drive from you to get onto the podium again. Did you expect that at the start of the race? No, I didn't. I didn't. I actually felt quite fast today, but um, yeah, I was just pretty, I wouldn't say angry about qualifying. I was more heartbroken. I was like, damn, we, we had a good shot there. And um, yeah, it was what it was. I was racing, so I started ninth and yeah, we had a good race. Yes, again, you showed us what you can do from a uh, detrimental qualifying position. Firstly, can you do it again tomorrow? And could you think you could, the win was on today? Honestly speaking, ha uh, head off to Mitch and, and, and Jaguar. They, they were really, really good today. Um, I, weirdly, I felt closer to them in qualifying trim than I did in the race. In the race, at the end, we had a, a good little chance to see where each other was strong, and I felt he was a bit stronger than me. So, um, yeah, we'll look at it and go again tomorrow. I think this is the third time we've had a, a Kiwi 1-2 on the podium. You guys are quite the pair. Yeah, wow. Well, um, quite the pair. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thanks. Great drive from uh, Nick Cassidy. That makes it his seventh podium of 2023. See him here getting his elbows out on Sasha Fenestraz in the early stages. Nice move there up the inside into four. And then as Jake Dennis's race came a little bit unraveled in the middle stages the line to take a second place victory great result here for him he'll be pretty pleased with that taking over the title lead as well Maximilian Gunter huge congratulations what a day for you and the team home race on the podium yeah of course it's an amazing feeling to put Maserati here on our first home race in Formula E on the podium straight away uh, incredible lots of Lots of emotions and, and happiness. Uh, it has been a tough weekend so far. Uh, we had a few issues that hopefully we can sort out for tomorrow. So we just had to deal with them today. We did a good qualifying and yeah, in the race we executed super well. And I'm just yeah, really, really happy about this podium. You are doing a tremendous job of bouncing back the difficult starts of the season that you and the team have had, uh, especially in hot races, it seems. What's the turnaround time? And do you think that this was possible before the race? 
Well, uh, I knew it's more difficult here to, to overtake, so energy management uh, was going to be crucial. This was clear. Um, to be fair, like yeah, top five, top six, I think was was something that we targeted. We wanted to score good good points, uh, but to take take the podium, obviously, um, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to take it, but it was not uh, expected today. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. Max Günther in the Maserati taking their first podium ever here in Rome. Great drive from seventh on the grid. Even after the restart, he was able to really get his elbows out with this move being made on Jake Dennis as he went down the inside for position. Really nice stuff then from Max Günther. He'll be very, very pleased with that uh, result and we'll see exactly what is uh, going to happen for the remainder of the championship with just three races remaining in uh, 2023. What an incredibly strong performance from everybody involved. So difficult it was after that red flag came out to get themselves composed and back ready for uh, racing action. And when the racing resumed, it was always going to be an exciting affair. And so it proved to be. Interestingly, Mitch Evans, the first driver to take maximum points in the race. That's the win, pole and fastest lap since Jake Dennis at the XL in London last year. So really strong start to his weekend. Strong start, strong weekend. Not a surprise in some respects because he's got a bit of history around here. But uh, now it's a case of going spraying some champagne on that podium, resetting and going again because tomorrow is going to be another day. Uh, you see the drivers there making their way into uh, the podium. Oli Askew down here. At least, at least I trust the driver. Huh? Wasn't really sure what I was getting into. Uh, let's listen and see what the drivers have got to say on the way to the podium. What's up, Sugar? There's no, there's no camera on, right? No, there yeah. will be. <laughs> <laughs> got ya. <you. laughs> I'll show you what, you what you can do around here. Oh, it's just, just a short ride. Probably faster than Nothing us. Special. Special. Yeah. Jake got the wrong left, huh? Yeah, yeah. where is he? Where did he finish? Four. 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 Still? Yeah, he saved that oh, that's impressive. Just to, yeah. I think he sacrificed two or three. He was like, right. Yeah. Are we allowed to go? Are we good to go? Yeah. All right. You actually turn the left and you hold it. Yeah. All right, welcome to Ollie's taxi service. Going to the podium. Hey, how many chassis are there for tomorrow? Is anyone? No, nobody's in the red. No, no. Just take it. Yeah. And I, I, I saw it. I saw it in the mirror. How, how did Seven. you get through? Because I, I, I went outside. You did, and I went because inside. I saw yeah. you guys inside, so I slowed down. I went middle of the track, yeah. so I knew at one point you'll come. You got some speed out though. Yeah, I, I went flat. But because all the guys behind me they crashed. So yeah. Yeah. I went full throttle to get through. <laughs> yeah, no, I slowed down. Because he's no. coming back. I went flat. I was like, if I don't have speed, yeah, he's gonna you. Sure. Yeah. 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 No, I just went, I slowed down a bit, went middle, yeah. and then my feeling was right because at yeah, one point he will come left, yeah. and it was super close. Same God. Oh, oh man. Oh, shit. But the Jeff as well, it was super close on the inside. Yeah, as well, yeah. yeah. Did you guys see the yellows immediately? I saw it spinning. Yeah. I saw it all but happening, and I'm like, but I think yeah, some, yeah, obviously, going. like, some guys had no idea, right? Yeah, sure. But um, they need to fix those potholes. There's a few, there's a few aggressive bumps there, right? Like he, yeah, was, two man he, was, he was pushing up. He was hustling. This is new, newly paved, huh? Yeah. This is, yeah. yeah. It's kind of part of the, that section as well. But. You had much pace, Max? Or? Uh, pace was okay. We were similar, think, no? Yeah, similar pace. But I was a bit on an energy compared to you two. Okay. I think you were the same, right? And if you Yeah. Alright, boys. Yeah. That Thanks for that, mate. That was great. Yeah. Send you the invoice. Amazing. <laughs> Send you the invoice later. Well, Ollie's taxi service providing a nice, calm drive to the podium here in uh, Rome. To be honest, I thought they were going to start belting out the Beatles and do a bit of a carpool karaoke thing, but I'm, to be honest, I'm quite grateful for everybody else that they didn't. <laughs> I think the carpool karaoke comes on the team radio. That's when you definitely hear some things. And listening to the team radio and some of the expletives today, then probably you didn't want to necessarily listen to them singing. But certainly these three are the ones that are going to be celebrating. They're the ones that are 
going to be telling the positive stories about today. There's quite a few people, though, that will be thinking about what might have been. Yeah, well, the second the podium's over, the focus, of course, shifts over to the, tomorrow. Round 14 of uh, the championship. The show uh, will move on as the drivers make their way onto the top three steps. Looking forward to seeing what their celebrations are going to be all about. Later, you can see the driver's room and uh, we'll see exactly what their thoughts were on what was a frantic and uh, dramatic round of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. As the drivers make their way on to those rostrum steps in a few moments' time, getting in more champagne and trophies from Rome for Mitch Evans to take home. Crucially, the man in the middle of your picture, Nick Cassidy, going to the top of the driver's standings after that race. Let's have a look then, shall we? Final classification of the results from round 13 of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. Mitch Evans takes top honours once again here in Rome ahead of Nick Cassidy and Maxi Gunter. Then it is Jake Dennis ahead of Jean-Eric Werner, the DS Penske. Nico Muller manages to equal at Cooper's best point haul of the season so far ahead of Pascal Berlein, Norman Natto and Sergio Sete Camera. Only his second points finish of the season ahead of Sasha Fenestras. A lot of drivers failing to finish following that incident. A bit further down the order, you can see a lot of the drivers who unfortunately failed to finish following the crash that brought out the red flag in the opening stages of that race. One of them didn't take to the restart. Here are the drivers' standings, though, after 13 rounds. It was one point to the advantage of Jake Dennis coming into round 13. After it, it is Nick Cassidy who sits at the top by five points over the Briton. Mitch Evans does himself absolutely no harm at all. Maximum points all here this afternoon means he moves to within 20 points. So the top three within a race-winning victory tally of one another. Good points on the board as well for Sergio Sete, camera in the Neo racing machine. Only his second points finish of the season. He moves himself a little bit closer to Edo Mortara in the Maserati. And Nico Muller also getting himself eight points on the board. He'll be absolutely thrilled, as will at Cooper. That'll feel like a race victory to the team. And speaking of the teams, here are the team standings. Envision Racing uh, have 243 points ahead of Tank Heuer Porsche on 237. Jaguar TCS Racing, only one car, of course, scoring at those points means that they're in third in the championship ahead of the Avalanche and Dretti. And you can see down at the bottom there, at Cooper doubling their points tally courtesy of the Swiss driver Nico Muller. Well now making their way on to the uh, podium. First of all is the team representative for Jaguar TCS Racing, this is Gareth Haradine, the chief mechanic. Uh, Gareth has been there for a long long time. He's seen this team building up into a strong strong position and uh, his job is he's got great experience but his job's invaluable as well what he brings to the team and deservedly up there picking up the trophy well soak it up for all it's worth gareth why not A in third place from maserati msg racing is maximilian gunter what a great drive from maxi gunter to get maserati's first podium in Rome of the uh, 2023 season. Great job from him. Seventh on the grid is where he started originally. And the German driver will be absolutely elated with that one on home soil for his team here uh, this weekend. Shaking hands and ready to take the trophy in a few moments time. What an absolutely crazy race that was. Time to take a breath and a, a quick pause from that one because it was frenetic from lights out to checkered flag. Next, in second place from Envision Racing, Nick Cassidy. Great drive from the Kiwi, Nick Cassidy. Looked like he was in a little bit of trouble this morning with his pace in free practice, but he really turned his fortunes around here this afternoon. Wasn't quite enough to take two in a row after winning at Portland a couple of weeks ago, but with a second place finish here this afternoon, he takes over the lead of the Drivers' Championship, which he'll be absolutely elated with going into round 14 of this double header weekend for the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. A few shake of the hands on the podium, and then it'll make his way into 
the number two spot. There can be no doubt about our winner here this afternoon. What a drive from the second Kiwi on the podium. Last and now, way up to the top our winner set. from Jaguar TCS Racing, Mitch Evans! What a drive from Mitch Evans. Took Jaguar's first victory here back in 2021. Did the double in 2022, last year in the Gen 2 cars. And you wonder whether he'd be able to do it as Fuller entered a new era into Gen 3. Why on earth would we ever have doubted him? Pole position, the fastest lap, and the race victory. A perfect 13th round of the championship for the Kiwi. Doing himself no harm at all, closing the gap down at the top of the title battle as well. To just 20 points between the top three drivers. It is all to play for then here. And now the national anthem of the winning driver from New Zealand. And Mitch next, Evans the national on the top anthem set of the podium. The winning team from Great Britain. Congratulations to all our winners. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Sanghun Lee, the COO and President of Hankook Tire Europe, to present the trophy to the winning team, Jaguar TCS Racing. Mr. Sanghun Lee takes the team representative trophy then to the team representative of Jaguar, Gareth Aradine. And now, please welcome Tiomo Hosimiemi, the president of Drive Products Division, ABB, to present the trophy to the third place driver, Maximilian Gunter. Tiomo Hosimiemi then, third place trophy to Maximilian Gunter on home soil here in Rome. Certainly something for the home crowd to smile about, especially considering the temperature Next, here this afternoon. Next, please welcome Marco Ferrari, the secretary general of ACI Sport, present the trophy to the second place driver, Nick Cassidy. And then time for Marco Ferrari to present that second place trophy to Nick Cassidy. What a drive from the Kiwi. And finally, please welcome Alessandro Honorato, the councillor of events tourism, Fashion Roma Capital, to present the trophy to our winner, Mitch Evans. And then the winning trophy presented to Mitch Evans. He's putting quite a collection of these, isn't he? Think about Rome for the Jaguar TCS racing driver. And what now, an the absolutely e superfan, stunning Alessandro weekend Monado to start for him. To our winning driver, Mitch Evans. And now it's now time, time to celebrate for the Moet champagne to be sprayed for the top three drivers. And well, if you're within uh, spraying distance of that, good luck to you. Might be a nice little refreshing shower for some, but what a drive from Mitch Evans and for Jaguar TCS Racing. The perfect weekend, pole position, fastest lap, and the race victory. A couple of bottle of bubble, bubbles to take back to the Jaguar 
TCS Racing team here this afternoon as well. Absolutely delighted. There are three things guaranteed in life, death, taxes, and a Rome e Prix that Mitch Evans wins. I'll tell you what, Alan, it was just magnificent. And it's a race that had everything, but what a performance from him. Yeah, it was fantastic. He was fantastic all day, really. You know, the only thing I would say is yesterday in free practice one, he was maybe a little bit frustrated, but after that, <laughs> Everything he's done, pole, win, fastest lap. He had to fight for it a little bit. I don't think it was quite so easy. He, went, he missed the attack mode, and so there's a few things that can tidy up, but that's actually bad news for everybody else. If there's areas where he can still be better, and he's already won by a couple of seconds over Nick Cassidy, then I think they should be fearful tonight. And the context of doing it when he did, in fourth place, we were talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We see obviously amazing celebrations there. The crowd have massively enjoyed it, but everyone knew that Mitch needed a special performance here to stay really in, a, in the championship hunt and boy did he achieve it. Yeah, definitely. I think Mitch was hoping today that there would be a couple more cars between him and Nick Cassidy, of course. Um, hopefully tomorrow, if we, can, if we can build up a couple of these cars, that is a scenario that Mitch could look at. But uh, yeah, faultless job from him. He's just got to keep on doing that again tomorrow. He can only really influence what he's doing in the car, have a solid qualifying, and then look toward tomorrow. But as we see here, a lot of cars, a lot of crew members running to get spare parts already. It's going to be interesting overnight for a lot of these guys. Very long evening ahead. Alan, it's quite a strange almost feeling amongst the pit lane. We've seen car after car go past in very conditions. Yep. We've seen Sam Bird's one go into the garage there. That was in, in an unbelievable state. Actually, I've never seen anything like this with Formula E. You've actually seen, it's been here before where it's been a similar thing with a, an incident roughly at the same point on the circuit. What the teams do is they're prepared for these situations. So they're pre-prepared. They have got certain parts of the car already assembled and prepared, built up just to bolt on. However, the main thing is they'll all be looking at the chassis. If they have to change the chassis, that's a heck of a lot of work. And so therefore, there and the powertrain because those are really I would say key commodities about it and uh, when you're in the middle of that pack you're in that incident area and uh, certainly it's now getting to the sharp end of the actual season itself and every point counts and everybody's fighting for something and these things happen talking about the incident we got to watch it a number of times but as for the drivers they saw various elements of it for the likes of Jake Dennis he went straight past it I'll be curious to know what he thought when he saw it so let's head to the driver's room and keep an ear out for this one because this could be fascinating Double yellow there, Rick. And that corner the race the yellow into six is a double oh. be. yeah Bohemi oh. was the worst man his hand again oh. is he okay no he's okay whoa, whoa. And this thing nearly flipped he nearly flipped man what? What? The halo there? Oof. Yeah. Antonio. Oh. Is it Antonio? Uh, Antonio. No, he did like wheel. Yeah, that one is bad. Me is now, I think. <laughs> there on the left. Luckily, it was a bit angled there. Man, yeah. look Luckily at the. I think one DS. Years. If he was in the driver's cell, it wouldn't be good. Oh, that's PU, that's everything, huh? What a contrasting day for James Barkley, by the way. We saw the agony, but then we also saw the ecstasy of the performance with Mitch Evans. I mean, his blood pressure must be through the roof right now, not being sure how to feel. Yeah, day of ups and downs. We've got the, the winning car right behind us. You can see Mitch also didn't have a completely smooth sailing day. You can see a couple of marks in the front right wheel. So he also had his, his day where he had to fight for the win today. It wasn't all easy sailing, but uh, yeah, that's Formula E. It is indeed Formula E, and Formula E was very strange. It turned into a 12-car race in the end. And talking about the incidents, let's head over to Saunders, who's going to talk a little bit more about the damage to the cars. Yes, so I'm down here just outside the Maserati MSG Racing uh, garage, and you've got Eduardo Mortara's car there in a very, very bad condition. Let's just uh, let the shots tell the story as you get a bit closer into that. You've got all of the Maserati, you've even got some Stellantis people uh, all assessing the damage, because what they want to know is, what parts are needed because there is a shortage because of the number of cars in that incident. Alan touched upon it there a little bit shortly, a little bit ago. And I've already heard at one point that uh, there might not even be enough tubs for all the, all the cars that need them. So tomorrow morning could be very interesting in terms of the championship and which cars are even able to be on track. That 
that really is the big question. And in terms of the championship, it now means that it's wide open. We've got a new leader, Alan, in the form of Nick Cassidy. Got a new leader. We've got Mitch Evans getting closer for tomorrow. It's really important. And there's another race. And so there's another bit of excitement and intrepidation that's going to come from it. And right now, all the teams will just be thinking about not what happened, but what's going to come tomorrow and preparing for that. It was a first for Jake Dennis as well. His first points that haven't been from a podium. How do you think he might respond tomorrow? He has to respond. I think he needs to have a word with his engineer. I think there was a bit of discrepancy about how many laps the race was going to be. Him and Sasha Fenestra is dropping back in that race. I think there was more in it today for Jake. Positive pace from him as well. So I think uh, we're up for a, for a special one tomorrow. And a very quick word for Max Gunter. A podium performance at his home pre in terms of the team. It was a feisty drive for Max Gunter, but we've seen that from him before and I'm sure we'll see it from him again. And uh, I think that from Maserati's point of view, it was a lift up because they also had one of the cars out of the game in that incident as well. And finally, Pascal Verlain, how can he possibly turn his fortunes around? Or has the four horse of the apocalypse now turned into the three musketeers? There's only one way to find out, and that's the tune in tomorrow. We will have quality kicking off in the morning and then it'll be a race once again. And if it delivers anything like this, there are many reasons why you've got to join us. See you then. Formula E returns to Europe for round 13 of the championship. The Hankook Romy Prix. Mitch Evans to win for Jaguar TCS Racing.